Well, good evening and welcome to the Fireside Sessions. I'm Sam Simmons. And I'm still in that shitty chair that I discussed the last time we did one of these. And you maybe see that guitar there and say, oh, what a lovely guitar. It's not. It's, it's a piece of shit, um, but it's my piece of shit. It was my first guitar. My parents bought it for me, I think, when I was 15 um, from a local shop in Erin, Ontario, Canada. It's a Gibson Les Paul copy. It's a bolt-on neck. It's made in Japan. Pickups suck. Um, but it's mine. And when I play it, there's some connection to the past, there's some resonance in my soul, every chord I strike with it. And it's mine. And I don't really care if you like, oh, it's not a 1959 Les Paul Gold Top, because it's mine. It's mine. What's your story? Thanks for being here. Again, I'm Sam. Uh, we have a great lineup of guests, but we are also here for Burns Night. Now, warning, this is not a Burns Night supper. It's not a Burns supper. We're not going through uh, the regalia and the piping and all the routines, but we will discuss some of those things. And I mentioned my parents bought me uh, that guitar over there. My parents also always had a rich library at home, and I remember that. I remember um, from our apartment on St. George Street to our house later in life on Heathdale Road, always there, there being books around uh, in different rooms, libraries of different themes, and some of them were, I can't remember all the names, but like the tyranny of work and um, the hidden injuries of class and all these names that still stick with me because they just jumped off the shelf. Um, and I noted the last time I was home, my parents moved to a new house, not a house I grew up in. And obviously it had to call their library as time goes on. They had to choose what to keep and what not to keep. And near my mother's bed, there are, I think, five to ten books, some old English, some Anglo-Saxon, um, some more modern poetry and crime, crime that she loves as well from the 20th century. And there's a book of Burns poems. That made the call through all these houses. So there is something about Robbie Burns that resonates with us all. So for the fireside sessions, we try through these cold media in front of us, through this very cold digital medium, try to add some warmth to connect through these strange times. Um, so let's bring in our first guest, the fire. Thank you to my friend Chris for providing that beautiful fireplace. That's tonight's star of the show our fireside and I'll bring in um, two friends who've been on this uh, program. We've only done three episodes and have been with us from the beginning and actually encouraged us to continue. So thank them both. I'll bring in Dr. Nicholas Morgan. Hi, Nick. Hi, Sam. Hi, everyone. And of course, Charles McLean. Hey, Charles. Hi, guys. I've got a real fire behind me, by the way. I'm going to roast, but welcome to you all. Well, your dedication to the cause is admirable. You are sitting Quite low to the ground, it looks like. I'm sitting on the. I'm sitting cross-legged in front of my computer <laughs> on the floor. Yeah, you're just showing off now, cross-legged. Nick, how 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 how, well, how long can you sit cross-legged? Well, well, we'll we'll see. It depends how good the conversation is, by the way. <laughs> well, we'll bring in our next guest. Oh yes, yes, great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how fascinating uh, a very good evening everybody uh goodness knows uh, i'm so embarrassed you know listen uh, i think charlie i'm going to jump into your fire in a minute so listen thank you so much it's uh, nice to see that, that uh, you're reading my book but i hope you're reading uh, nick morgan's book you know big stride and all that for johnny walker so great read i can fully recommend it yeah, yeah. Thank you, Richard. Well, I've only made it to the second chapter in each of your books, but uh, I still would highly, highly recommend both of them as a great bread time reading again and again and again. <laughs> Let's bring in another guest that we have, the, our friends from Simply Whiskey, Simon Roser and Francie Fairlow. Hey, guys. Good evening, gentlemen. How are you doing? Thanks for inviting us to participate. Good evening to everybody. 
Uh, well, I feel Richard, like I feel like a charlatan in such esteemed company here, guys. You know, but I'll do my best. <laughs> At least we know your place right off the top. That's, that's right. <laughs> Charlie. I admire. I mean, excuse me, Richard. I admire the depth of that pour. Are you from jet lag, or is that just a normal dose? No, this is uh, actually this is one of my favorite glasses that I was given many years ago by uh, one of. Uh, dedicated people that came to my presentations. But I always think that if you get a glass like this, unlike the Copita glass, it's got to be generous. And uh, you did tell me it could be a long night. So especially drinking with Nick and Charlie there, I, I wanted to make sure I had a really big glass to start with. So <laughs> just keep looking at the level because I intend to have a good evening. So <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't agree with you more, Richard. Big glasses. I've got a big glass as well. They're for drinking. Okay? The the capitas we use for appreciation. That's a different thing altogether. But just for fun, like this evening, you need a you need a, a, a decent sized glass. Well, gentlemen, gentlemen, I see your glasses. I see your glasses now. Raise you a quick. Oh, <laughs> we are all friends here. I just wish that you could come and drink it out with me. I'm sure you'll manage. I'm doing my best. Keepers and masters all around. I think Franchi is trying to give you a hint, Dr. Nick and Richard. <laughs> <laughs> I Come on, Nick, you're up to something. I can oh, tell. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. Okay. Too small. That looks like from the quake. Small. Keepers. Yep. That's, uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a pretty hefty, hefty dram. Very yeah. nice. Yeah. Does it make the whiskey taste a little bit metallic? Uh, to be honest, Johnny, I haven't, I haven't tried it yet. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm very glad that like like Richard's got, or you've got. No, that, that will be, that will, hey, Nick, that will be solid silver. Don't mess around. Uh, yeah, yeah. It may be. Keep it clean. Yeah. That's the main thing. It may be, maybe. But, Charlie, you've, you've, you've been at the dentist today. Can you actually taste the whiskey? My, my, my entire jaw is uh, I, I was the, I got back from the dentist about an hour ago and my entire jaw is frozen so if I sound a bit odd or if I start dribbling I hope that you will all forgive me you know the uh, well Charlie there's no dribbling yet and you sound fine but we'll keep our eye peeled for it that's kind of thank you. What are we all drinking? It is it is we're approaching Burns Night, and I don't know if you guys know, but I I, I my wife and I got married on Burns Night, um, two thousand nine, and I think uh, probably London's best Norwegian Canadian Jewish Burns Night wedding ever. I, I think it's safe to say that <laughs> it was a rare occurrence. Um. But mainly, why do we choose that night? I mean, we've, I, you all know, I fell in love with Scotland when I moved there. 2002, I moved to Scotland and was enamored with the, the people, the culture, obviously whiskey, and, and, and so much more. Simon, and I'll bring you back in. Apologies. And um, quickly learned, though, that if I wanted to have a career in Scotch whiskey, the only way I could be sure to not have to work on Burns Night was to get married on Burns Night. So that was part of the plan. Uh, and it's worked. <laughs> I'm holding this in the week of Burns Night, so all Burns suppers that online in the virtual world will be happening. So please check with Whiskey Geeks and find out what's going on. This is not that tonight. Tonight we're gathering to sort of maybe bring up some of the legacies of Burns, a few of the traditions that we'll have uh, from our friends from Australia and America, uh, sharing some of those. But I, I thought we could maybe start with your connection to Burns. Simon and Franchi, I know that you run burn sites this time of year when, when before lockdown, before the situation we're in now. What's Burns mean to you? It's a wonderful opportunity to get Fu and Uncle happy with Drutti Cronies. And my Franchi, I don't like to, um, to be challenged. And I see you <laughs> the size of this big bunny birdie, huh? <laughs> That looks like one of the bowls you get your Indian in, mate, not a quail. <laughs> I think it's multifunctional. Now, um, this particular glass, we can obviously thank Raymond for its beautiful design. But on this occasion, I think 
my best more appropriate. So Burns Night, for me, um, as you suggested, um, Dr. Sam, you know, French and I have been very lucky to host Burns Night's events all over the world, but ultimately it all comes back um, to the same principle, which is great times with great friends, sharing uh, wonderful moments together. Um, obviously, you can celebrate um, Burns Night anywhere in the world. You don't have to be Scottish. You don't have to be familiar with uh, much of his work. Um, he's a wonderful person to research if you're interested. But I think everybody can relate to the idea of coming together to enjoy a good time with friends. And that's what Burns Night means to me. So here's to you all. And to all those watching, I, I, I say to you, Slanjavar as well. So for, for me, Slanjavar, Sam, for me, um, I feel somewhat of a charlatan. So when I was growing up um, in Glasgow, I went through school and I never, I never done any burns in school. It wasn't until I met Simon that my burns appreciation was lit, if you like. Simon and I, you know, were, were asked to do a Burns Night. Um, when was it? 2008? 2006. 2006. And unbeknown to the guy that booked us, I had never read a bit of Burns before that booking. So it was there that I decided I needed to really cram and get to know this guy and understand his work. And it kind of lit a passion inside me, you know. So for the first, for example, for the first uh, Burns Night, I foolishly thought, well, I'll do Tama Shanta, but I won't recite it. I'll just read it. It must have been terrible. It must have been terrible for the people. I know it was terrible for me, right? It was terrible for me. So then I vowed, okay, if we get booked again, if this guy for some reason decides to book us again, um, then I'll know it off by heart. So I spent that la that next year learning the poem, um, and we managed to pull it off. And we've done so many, you know, you know since. So we must be doing something right, Simon. Well, I guess a matter of opinion. Um, the, <laughs> the person you're referring to is, of course, the, the amazing Jamie Forbes. Um, yes. Uh, Jamie was responsible, um, uh, along with Jim Wrigley, uh, the Albanac days, the Albanac Scottish Department of Fargo School, you might remember it. Um, they went on to book us not once, but I think about uh, 14 times. <laughs> So we thank them very much for showing uh, us, uh, you know, their confidence and giving us the ability to come all the way to the great heights of indeed. I mean, this is the pinnacle of what we've done so far. Absolutely, absolutely. You guys, you know, uh, so thank you very much for considering to invite us on. Yeah, I get If I may, if I may, the idea that you know, as we do, went through all these burns night, you re you recognise that it's such a special evening because people are coming together to have a fantastic evening and, and listen and, and show the respects to a man who you know, 250 years has gone, but yet we still, over 250 years has gone, but we still celebrate his life, such a short life, 37 years. Um, that to me is, is incredible and just to be a part of that um, and to help or to, to, to introduce people to that is, is a, a special privilege. Well, you raised something important that I think people watching this, maybe not everyone knows much about Robbie Burns. And I know we are going to continue around the table and to see what our connection is. Does anyone, can anyone tell us a little bit about him? You, you did say he had a young life, but Richard or Charlie, do we have details of Burns' life? Um, well, I would, I would prefer to come in with that. I, I dug out, a, 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 it was a Burns Supper talk that I had to do, an immortal memory. Um, many years ago, and it was really about Burns as a drinker. Now, and which I'm going to refute, by the way. Um, so I think we could perhaps leave that, um, and to, to if it's appropriate later, um, to talk about it. I mean, I can throw it in now if you want, but the uh, I think we need to talk about that, Charlie. Yeah, it's a, it's a, maybe later, but what we have, we'll have Rachel here, we'll have Andrew here. I think it'd be maybe a more robust conversation to debate the legacies. Uh, um, when they're here, because misinformation is almost a tradition with burn suppers, in my experience. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you had to remember that the, I think the first burn supper was held about three years, two years, I think. Nick, you can correct me. Uh, uh, after he died, and the, um, you know, he as as Franchi says, he was a young man, and the, um, but even by that, and 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 you know, died in 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 poverty as he had lived in relative poverty, and the. Um, 
But even by the time that he died, uh, what are we talking about? 97, 797, 1802, I think the first burn supper was held in 1802, was it not? Something like that. But anyway, the so so even by even within within just a couple of years of his death, he was being celebrated. Um, his life was being celebrated, and um, the more you the more you read about Robert Burns, um, the more remarkable um, he was. A, he was truly a genius, uh, both in terms of his output. And the quality of the output, not only his 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 poems, but also his songs. Um, and I mean, of, of which there are, there are many. I mean, there are probably about as many songs as as as, as poems. And you tend to forget that. And they were, and the the and an aspect of genius is being able to make them all so different. Anything that that you it's, it's, output is one thing, and then but make them so different. And and that's why and, the, and then the content, of course, the you know his human content is so perceptive for, for his own time in the late um, 18th century, but running right down to our own time, and really through through all all nations. The uh, one of the earliest burnt suppers that I had to do was in Moscow. And in, in, in those days, um, uh, the, the Gorbachev was the president of the Moscow Burns Club, um, and he was not president ex officio. He was president because of his passion for Burns, and 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 Burns Club, the Moscow Burns Club at that time, was the largest one in the world, the largest Burns Club in the world, and so you know his his humanity. Um, um, appeals appeals to 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 all people across across the ages. A truly remarkable guy, a genius. And Charlie, the Russians, the first to put Burns, and maybe they even the only to put Burns on a postage stamp. You know, they, they respect him that much. They put him uh, on a postage stamp. That, that, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty I, sure think, I learned that at one of Richard's presentations. Yes, yes, that would make, I might have stole that from Richard myself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, when I say stole, I mean borrowed. <laughs> Thursday, January nineteenth, eighteen oh four. It was a Tuesday. It was a Tuesday. Was right. <laughs> You're right, Charlie, about um, about his uh, his output. I mean, over two hundred poems and over four hundred songs. There we and, are. Thank and, you. So you. You know, bang on when you're talking about it being relatively unusual. I believe. Um, I mean, you, you've probably researched it more than I, but it was not normal to be as expressive um, back in that time, I don't believe. So his ability to analyse and express very complex human emotion in the way that he did, um, quite remarkable. In fact, it is suggested, and I'd have to double check the source perhaps with you, Charlie, but there were some letters discovered between Robert Burns and his doctor um, suggesting that the medication he was being given uh, towards a later time in his life, suggesting that he may in fact have uh, had suff you know, suffered from depression, which is fascinating um, because with carbon dating techniques, modern techniques, we learn so much more about some of these illustrious characters from the past. So that certainly, you know, might resonate with some people who, you know, think that, you know, mental health or, or modern mental health issues are, are, are somehow new or, and haven't been experienced by, you know, humans for all the time. But in fact, um, the suggestion is that Robert Burns himself, you know, uh, had some struggles in that regard. So really, he, I think we're only really starting to understand this very complex character, which I, which I find fascinating. I, that's very interesting, Simon. I, I hadn't heard about these letters, but you know, from what one, when you read about the life, the the um, there were certainly periods, highs and highs and lows. I think it was almost sort of the, 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 the when you read about his time in Edinburgh, for example, when he was on show and the um, and was being celebrated, um, and clearly he was on a high like there was nothing. You know, I mean, it was always said. 
you know, that he could speak in public address. Robert Burns could speak better English than the likes of David Hume, for example, and most of the Scottish judges of the day who could speak Scots. He also had a command of France, he, uh, the French, and he could he could read he could read Latin. He was very well educated, although the poor ploughboy. He had a very good teacher uh, in his early days, but he could. I mean, he was a very handsome fellow, um, and he 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 knew how to dress up and how to. How to, how to, to amongst the the posh society of Edinburgh, um, um, he could he could he could pass muster, and of course the women just loved him, you know. And a lot of the men were a bit envious of him, but he had a lot of well. And, and Nick will tell us about this, I'm sure. The the, uh, but you know, a lot of the aristocratic patrons who, who really, you know, I mean, he was never their equal, but he was always welcome in the house because he was such a convivial and such an intelligent and such a conversational character, you know? I mean, um, but anyway, the, but I think that the the ups and downs, I think he did he did have ups and downs. Um, and often the downs were in relation to his affairs, his, his um, romantic um, uh, infatuations, you know, the uh, so human. And I think, you know, wearing you know, hat, his, his heart on his, on his, on his, uh, you know, and, and wrote about it, you know, and they're so human, so human. Mm. Great, great guy, great guy. Golly. His sleeve. His sleeve. I think if I'm <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, his sleeve. I think, uh, if I may, um, Burns, he means so many different things to so many different people. You know, I, there's no doubt that he was a grafter. Simon, you talk about his his um, his output. Twenty two years, he wrote his first poem when he was fifteen years old in a field to um, Meg, his darling Meg. Um, and Mel. Someone again, he had an infatuation with. Fifteen years old. Now he died when he was thirty seven. So twenty two years to 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 write these beautiful poems. But let's not and, and songs over two hundred poems, nearly four hundred songs. But let's not also forget he was toiling in the field. He had his father's farm that he was looking after. And then when he couldn't do that anymore, he wrote to one of his friends to try and get, you know, many different jobs as uh, an excise man. To, you know, he eventually pissed them off, so they, they cut his wages. And so he was he was a grafter. He was going to leave Scotland to go overseas because, you know, he, to escape, yeah. to escape um, his, his uh, betrothed oh, family. Really, yeah. I mean, but it's an incredible thing to think, like, 22 years, it can't be an easy place, an easy time to live, the 18th century, but yet so, so, um, such beautiful words that he wrote over, over that short time. Incredible. Let's get off Burns then. I, I, I love this though. I mean, this is, this is, unless Richard, Richard, do you, do you want to, somebody contribute on Burns before we turn the, the camera on you? Well, you know, uh, what a lot of people have said, a bit like Scotch whiskey. You know, we've got a nation here that produces whiskey. We've got Robert Burns. But because of whiskey and Robert Burns, we've managed to penetrate so many different parts of the world. It's just quite amazing. But more importantly, what Robert Burns did when you study him, he actually told you something about life, what it was all about. And particularly when, yes, he had many affairs, many people, many uh, lovely ladies that he loved, but he was able to express that so eloquently in his songs and his poems. But one thing a lot of people don't know is that all these lovely ladies that he perhaps had an affair or loved, not one of them said anything bad about him. Indeed. And that's amazing, but that is true. If you look through the records, you'll find most people, even the men who were in company, as Charlie said, he was revered in every way because he just touched so many people, so many souls, and that's why we remember him so warmly to this day. Mm. Yeah, you're here. Sam, I, I was talking to Charlie about this point uh, a little earlier today, but I, I think probably Burns needs to be thanked by the Scotch whiskey industry because he was probably the first person who wrote about Scotch whiskey as being the national drink. And, and also not just the national drink, but a very egalitarian drink, very egalitarian drink. And because of his fame, of course, 
that that message went went before him, um, not just in Scotland, but but way way beyond that. So you know, today 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 we talk about um, perhaps somewhat questionably influencers and what what they can do for for our whiskies. But this 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 man is the biggest influencer of all. Yeah, <laughs> he wrote it when he did, and people are still as we are as we are this evening talking about Burns and Scotch whiskey. So his contribution to our livelihoods. Uh, yeah. is immense, you know, immense, and, and, and to the drinks that I hope everyone's enjoying that's watching us this evening. Yeah, cheers to you guys. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. With a poet to resonate with so many people and to be actually be malleable, you know, to have to to touch on nerves, as Charlie was saying, hard on sleeve, and as Simon was also indicating, um, to be able to be pulled in different directions, whatever your need might be. If you want to find in in the poem, um, you know, accounts of the hardships of poverty or the absurdity of accepting being poor, you can find it in the same poem. And I think that's that's something really magical about his work. It's, it's obviously cross cultures. I've been at Burn Suppers from Taipei to Toronto, in Delhi, you know, all over the world. I'm sure Richard, I'm sure we all have. And there's something about again the bar that that speaks more widely, just as just as the drink in our glass does. Speaking of traveling the world, let's take a little break. We're going to go to our friends in Australia. We'll take a video break, um, and they will, they're will they coming in live now. I just got to turn the television on, and they're going to speak to us. I don't know what they're going to speak to us about because that's that, that's the brief I gave them, BU. Um, they're not going to do anything Burnsy just yet, but we will have them address a the haggis later. Uh, so let's welcome our friends, Ross Blaney and James Bunton. Hi everybody. Hi, uh, this is Ross Blaney, and this beside me here is Mr. James Button. Hello. How is everybody? How you doing? Um, and uh, welcome to our uh, fireside chat. Fireside chat. Second chats. one we've invited to. I know. We're so happy to be invited back. We weren't sure after the last one if we'd be invited back, but we're here. We we're did. so happy to be here. Thank yeah. you very much, Sam. It's very nice to be here, having a couple of drams. We got some feedback last time, saying that we, we were not fireside chatty enough. Yeah, we were. So we're we, maybe um, we weren't cozy enough. That's because we didn't have a fire. Uh, well, that uh, yeah, I was worried it wasn't cozy enough because we weren't sitting, you know, we weren't close enough together. I was a bit worried about that, and I think COVID, this is COVID, dude. Yeah, yeah I think this be, is this is close enough. I'm this happy to be enough. this far away from yeah, you. Yeah, I'll be happy yeah. further away, but I'm happy <laughs> this far away. But <laughs> so, well, we've got some candles, and there we have. And actually, the candles might make the screen flicker a little bit because I'm oh, trying. Yeah. Uh, Focus never thought about it, but it might happen. So I know. It does, we're, we're not experts at this, yeah, exactly. um, as we mentioned last time. We're not experts at a few things. Welcome, out. welcome to the COVID bar. The COVID we, bar, as we call it. Although uh, Dave Broom wanted to call it, what was it? The the, the plague, plague pit, plague pit, or plague something. Pit or the, we're not too sure about pit. Dave. So that's under review. But yeah, um, give us have more a bit names, about, please. We have a bit of Scottish stuff up. We do get some extra Scottish stuff. Get a little kilt down there. Get some flags yeah. as well. For, for and there's us as well. Why have we got that? Buns. Oh, yes, buns. Yeah, I forgot that's why we're here. <laughs> that's why we're here, right? <laughs> Did we get all about that? I've, well, you yeah, were picking up the haggis today, remember? I've, oh, um, yes. Yeah, good, good. I because, think, uh, we, have a, we will have a haggis. Yes. We will have a haggis. <laughs> and later on. I may have to nip out. And I, I, I've done, I don't know if you know, but I've done like loads of buns over the last yeah, have, haven't you? years. Yeah, well, like, usually around five or six around this time. Yeah. Um, very quieter now this year because this year's a bit different. COVID. Yeah. Well, but we have one next week. Though. We have one. Uh, yeah. First one together. We're, we're doing one together next week up at the the Newcastle Club in Newcastle. In Newcastle. Yeah. Uh, in Australia. Not yeah. Not not in, not, <laughs> not, not the other. We way. aye man. What's happening there? Like right? you know, people are be seeing man. Yeah. What? <laughs> they wouldn't know what you're saying if you talked like that. Nah, they wouldn't do. But they're not going to know what we're saying anyway. Because they wouldn't know what we're saying anyway. Because we're doing it in old Scots. We're going to be Burns. doing all the Burns so, poems, um, so they're not going to have an idea what we're saying anyway. What's your favourite Burns poem? My favourite, hands down, Tam O'Shanter. Oh, okay. Tam O'Shanter has always been my favourite since I was a wee guy. Uh, you know, when I was six or seven, I had to recite a good part of Tam O'Shanter at school. the longest ones there. I know, exactly. Yeah, it threw me in the deep end. I was only six or seven at the time. But I, I loved it. My parents took me to Alloway. And they took me to see Robert Burns' house where he grew up. And I remember hearing the poem being recited. Recited? And going to the Alloway Kirk, the old Alloway Kirk, and being so scared. 
Is it such a vivid poem and it's it's scary as well? It is, and even if you don't know the words, if someone's doing it justice, you feel it. You feel the yeah. You know, you feel scared, especially as a kid. I got to see that when I was uh, when I was a kid. Um, are you wearing a bit of a turn and tie there, my friend? I, I do a bit of a turn and tie. It's quite dark in here as well. We may not be able to see. I have the black watch turn here, and um, yeah, I'm a bit of a fan. It matches my kilt, which I'm obviously definitely wearing under here. It's pretty warm, but obviously we're wearing our kilts too. It is, and it is 32 degrees, and we've got candles on to be a bit more cosy. I so. know, real candles as well, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what have you got for your turn? Well, my tie is uh, my is, is William Grant's turn. Oh. This is his turn, the William oh, Grant's nice. turn, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I've heard you look a bit like William Grant as well. well or seen that you look a bit like him, actually. No, I don't think it was, someone saw a photograph once of me and thought I looked a bit like him, but I... Uh, pretty close. I, yeah. It's very close. Yeah. I, I, you guys went to school together, didn't you? <laughs> we never got confused at school, you know, yeah. So, you know, I was his teacher. You know <laughs> oh, yeah, but, so that was... Uh, no, no, William Grant uh, uh, is my turn. Yes. But we are going to do a wee bit of something special tonight we've never done we before, are. Ross. Yeah, a little bit of the address of the haggis a bit later on in the programming. Yeah, we're, we're going to back come up. back in a wee while, and we're going to do the old Tadagas, and I've done it many times myself, and I, I know it off my heart, and you have. You, you, this might be your first time doing I've it. I've never done it before. This is my first time. I've never done it my first. verse for verse. Yeah, we're going to go verse for verse, a little bit different. I'm looking forward to it. Cut that haggis you got today open, we'll, and... We'll uh, cut the haggis that I got earlier on, yeah. Mm. <laughs> we'll, we'll have a haggis here. We'll definitely you have a haggis. haggis. Of course, yeah, I wouldn't forget a thing like that. We're doing the address of the haggis. Yeah, how well, could I forget exactly. that? So we're going to do it for verse for verse and see how we go. So I mean, certainly don't um, hold anything against us if it seems like it's not the, the best one you've ever seen, but we're going to have a bit of a laugh at it. But it might be. It could be. It could very well be. Yeah. You never know what's going to happen, do you? But we will see you guys later on for a bit of an address of the haggis. Yeah. We're going to have a couple of whiskeys in the meantime. Excellent. Yeah. All right. Well, see you guys shortly. Cheers to you guys. Cheers to you. Oh, are we having a... Oh, 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 hey. oh Always there. See Cheers. You shortly. <laughs> well, Richard, they, they really wanted to be here. The time zone obviously is a challenge. Um, I think Raw, James, and I are probably of the same whiskey generation who who really came into this industry. And I, I don't mean this to kiss your ass a bit, but at your feet, I think, and, and many like you. But it's, it's not, it's not uh, take it easy, Nick. No, whatever. Historians don't have the same impact. Nick, you're muted. You're muted, you're Nick. Muted. I can hear you, Nick. But Richard, I think what I was... Uh, Nick is going to say something berating. Uh, I admit to myself. Um, I wonder if you knew that Richard and I once spent the most wonderful night together. It was, it was astonishing. And I don't know what Richard remembers of it, but my principal memory is that Richard kept his tie on for the whole night. <laughs> well, we story. But Richard, around the, around the world, you just think of how many people you've brought to whisk and all the, all the accolades, a lifetime achievement awards from all the big judging bodies and many, many more. Um, White Mackay Light, um, all these fantastic similar achievements. Um, and now, now 50, over 50 years in the Scotch whiskey industry, and the 2021, you made the New Year's Honours list as an OBE. What, what, can, what can I say? Um, you know, I, I feel very humble. It, it doesn't really, I'll be honest, it doesn't feel like, you know, uh, 55 years being in the industry. But I say this with absolute sincerity. When I look around, I'm seeing Charlie's face, I'm seeing Nick's face, I'm seeing so many people that have been involved with it along with yourself. And that's not just a like, that's a deep respect, a love that I have for all these people that have been involved with. But as many people will know, when you go and do a presentation, and there are many people that we do presentations around the world, and I can see by their body language, oh, I don't really like whiskey, it's a bit hard. And then you slowly take them in and you tell them, hold it long in your mouth, keep it there, keep it there, then wait for the flavors. And then suddenly you see that sort of relief coming in their face and then they become, actually, I think I like Scotch whiskey. And to my mind, body language can't lie. I look always into eyes like, okay, we've got Zoom just now, but we're at least communicating in some shape or form. 
but it's the, the, the reaction that I get from people that really helps to raise my passion for so many things and really helps to, I think Scotch whiskey really does, like Burns, bring us all together. And that's why when I look back over that 55 years, I, I'm deeply privileged to have known so many people through, through all the organizations, but I can say, are they your competitors? No, they're my friends, because there's no way that I, in any shape or form, that I'm gonna say anything bad about the whiskey. I'm gonna to help to promote their whiskey. And uh, that that's the essence of it all. So when I think of the OBE, I think of, yeah, it's a fantastic award. I'm, it, it's something I'll cherish for the rest of my life. I'm just sorry that my father, who was my mentor, my blender, my grandfather to say to him sorry dad look look what i got it's keeping the family tradition going but it's really the friends that make it so special and and i mean that sincerely that's lovely and i think i think that's something that all scots that i've met on this whiskey journey don't give themselves enough credit for and i hope you don't get too embarrassed with me saying and i've said it before and nick you've heard me say this to people i think it's such a generous industry but it comes down to the people and you mentioned a moment ago turning people on to whiskey, but never at a presentation of Richard Patterson or any any good representative of this industry, do you speak down to the people in the audience. In fact, what you say is, come, come with me, wait while we come see what we can see. And there's something about that rising tide and that bringing people along with you um, that is that I think is really special in, in Scotch whiskey in, in particular. And I hope that's part of at least why uh, you were honored with, with so many honors and accolades over your career. But it, it's, so, it's so great. I mean, many of us are watching in here tonight. You know, we still talk about 1997 when Frankfurt had their first whiskey festival. 1998 was when uh, New York had their whiskey festival. But then all the whiskey people, all the whiskey writers, the internet, uh, you know, WeChat and everything came in. And the communication of single malt whiskey, blended whiskey, has really exploded. We, we talk about a renaissance of whiskey, but it really is on an all-time high that is going to sim so many different parts of the world and they really are enjoying it, but they are looking. And what the Zoom calls have done or the, the you know cutbacks and being retained in our homes, we've actually had a little bit more time to perhaps look at a whiskey. We've perhaps taking our time a little bit more to really see what a great product it really is and not be in a hurry. It's not ideal, the situation we're in, but it maybe has made us appreciate those things that we took for granted in the past. And, you know, friends in particular, sharing and, uh, you know, talking is what we're doing this very evening. Mm. Richard, I want to ask you, Richard, the... the I mean, you particularly, Nick and myself, Sam to a degree, um, but we've been involved in this wonderful um, industry uh, at a crucial time. If you remember that the 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 eighties were a pretty dire period for blended Scotch in particular, um, and then the then malt whiskey took off, and then suddenly. Gradually through the 90s, there was, and indeed, Nick, you played a very important part for, when, for United Distillers. <coughs> I, I was, I was, I was it, to measure the, the release of the classic malts in 88 as being a, a milestone in, in opening up the idea of regionality, the idea that, that, that malt whiskies were not all the same. And I mean, remember, I mean, in, in, even by 1990, there weren't that many single malt whiskies generally promoted and generally available. It had increased during the 80s, but go back 10 years to, to, to 1980, and really there weren't that many. So what we happened to, to be there and indeed, I think, play our part in, um, in, in the, the the revival of the interest in Scotch whiskey, initially through malt whiskey, and now the the because um, now now blend of course is catching up as well, um, but the the it's been a it's been the most exciting period, and the um, we've all we've all played our part, and many you um, m m many of us um, many others, 
Um, but it's it's a wonderful thing. And but you're you're so right, Richard, that the the the, the what we might now consider as being the global whiskey community, you know, which communicates furiously on on social media, uh, which attends um, these massive shows all over the world. I mean, heavens above, you know, if we weren't locked down, we we could we could probably go to a show pretty well every week somewhere in the world, you know. Um, yes, and yeah, and these shows are, are, are attracting two or three thousand people. You know, over 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 a weekend. I mean, it's it's phenomenal, and unlike, it's really unlike any other. Well, I don't know of any other product, but I mean, it's certainly unlike wine. It's certainly unlike beer. It's, um, and I don't know about motor cars or football or whatever. But the the the, uh, but it the, the, this bonding of the people um, who who share their their only. You don't know who they are. They're postmen and they're judges you know um the, and, the and that, that's why you, you know when we talk about that we had the whiskey festivals in new york as a classic example we all did our presentations our master classes we we're all competitors but i always and i even record it in the book at the end of the evening we then went to the bar uh, then we communicated and all these things about competition competitors just went completely and utterly out of the window we yep. all became friends to try and support each other. And that's what I think from that, we've managed to raise the profile of Scotch whiskey even more, you know, around different parts of the world. So Richard, then let me let me ask a question. One of the three questions I'd like to get in, if I can, before, before we lose this time together. Um, and it relates to what, what you were both saying just there. We have a world of whiskey now. Um, and you're talking about leadership and, and, and rising together and this, this sort of very Scotch whiskey idea. The whole world now is making barley-based spirits, maturing it in oak. The whole world is making whiskey. Grains, whether it be rice or corn, but that single malt style is definitely a global thing now. Scotch is still seen as uh, the, the father of it, I guess, or the, the, the paternal leader of it. But I think... Um, with the whole world making whiskey and with this strong blending tradition, I know this resonates with Charlie as a blended whiskey scholar and drinker, and of course with Nick as well, and with you as a blender. Um, with Scotland being a nation of, 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 of blends, this industry growing on the back of blends, why isn't the world blending? I don't, blended whiskey still accounts for 90% of that whiskey market. I think perhaps, you know, when you think of the great blends like Johnny Walker, no question, are really up there in the lights. But, you know, a lot of people are looking for a little bit of innovation. And that's why, you know, we, we mustn't sit still. None of us can sit still, even the single malt. What did the Scotch whiskey um, presentations, festivals bring to us as blenders? Actually, a lot of the consumers that came, I mean, take for instance, uh, you know, South Africa, you know, there was someone in the region of uh, 20, 30,000 people there going like over in Singapore, a lot of people, but what they demanded was something different. If I turned up with a Dalmore 12 year old or a Jura 10 year old, they would get pretty perturbed about that. They're looking for new expressions. So I think what has happened nowadays is that people want to see a little bit more energy, a bit more lifestyle coming into the blends. I think many of them are changing, but the single malt scenario has sort of kind of pushed them in a little bit in the corner, but that's not to say they're not there. There are many great blends that are will be there, but there should be still many coming through, especially in the age category, 30, 40, 50 years old. They do exist. And once you taste these blends, as opposed to single malts, they're equally as good, some even better. You know, it's just a matter of trying to be a bit more innovative in a way and not so much. It took us many years, remember, to get rid of that pinstripe brigade as we talk about it in the 80s and the 90s. And that's when we started to lose it. And I feel just now with the new blends arising and the new packaging, very, very key, get the right packaging to draw in the consumer, then you're moving away from that pinstripe brigade to the younger people who are wanting to see something different. 
I, I, that's, that makes a lot of sense, especially in the Scotch whiskey context. But I guess with an even wider um, palette of flavors to deal with. I know I've heard you in, in your book, you describe um, distilleries as having orchestral features or musical uh, metaphors to describe them um, and all about color and flavor and sound. Um, with a wider palette and wi wider orchestra than ever before in the world of whiskey. Again, why isn't why don't other countries blend the way Scotland has? Well, remember, don't forget, we've got, what, 120, 130 actual really great distilleries in production. We've got 30 boutique distilleries coming in that are going to be even different. But look at the, the gallery of different flavors that are coming from Isla, Lowlands, Highlands, Campbelltons. Such a diversity. But what you really need to do is to look at that area, to look to see the many differences in other countries. I'm sorry, yes, America, Canada, you name it, they've got these areas, but they don't have that variety, that color mass of different characters emerging that allow them to show so many differences, not just in the single malts, but also the blended styles as well. Uh, and Sam, can I add to that? the? Um... You, you must remember that the since the fortunes of the Scotch whisky industry um, were based and are still based on blended Scotch from from way back from the nineteenth century, um, the blenders the blenders were the customers, and so the individual malt whiskies, malt whiskey distilleries would peg their production in any year on what they called filling orders, i.e orders from the blenders so right and 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 the, and very often they would not money wouldn't change hands so if you had a distillery i had a distillery you had a blend i had a blend you would say to me i want you to fill for me 100 casks next year and i say okay well i'll fill it to make it simple you fill for me 100 casks so money wouldn't change hands you know and so it was all to do with you know um, every, everybody relying on everybody else. You know, the, the, that was the way the industry worked. Now, what is interesting in this new era where there's been the, well, I've, I've, got, I've got on my list um, something like, I think it's 46 new distilleries, open, brand new distilleries opened since 2008. Now, not all of them, but many of them and, and they're not in this because they 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 they're not exchanging whiskey. They've got they've got to get they're going to have to rely on the the quality of the whiskey that they make malt 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 whiskey principally. Um, now to go straight to your point, the the German distilleries, the Ameri the huge raft of American distilleries, um, you know distilleries non non Scotch distilleries, if you like have never, Irish distilleries even, they've never really shared, there's never been this interaction, this exchange of, of whiskey from one distillery to another. Um, and so they're going to have to su survive in this increasingly competitive marketplace on their own merits. And then finally, the, the where Scotch has... It, it ultimately it depends upon flavor, and I'm Richard. I'm sure you'd agree with this. Ultimately, it depends upon flavor, uh, and not taking shortcuts. But the Scotch whiskey industry has this huge tradition of of, of craft culture, the, this this huge um, concern for quality. Um, uh, I mean, and, and but then and then above all, it's got the stories. It's got the story. It's been going for so long. And every distillery, every blended brand has potentially has stories about it. And the it's the stories that sell whiskey, um, but it's the flavor that sustains the 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 the, the consumer. It keeps them going. They go back and buy it again. Beautiful. Yeah, I love that sentiment. That makes sense. Nick, come on, you come in here. Will you support that? Uh, yeah, well, I do, I do, and I, and I was nodding my head uh, quite strongly when when both you and Richard Richard were talking. I mean, I think, um, I mean, obviously they do blend whiskey in in Canada and Japan and, and and whatnot, but it's done as Charlie describes in a very different way in terms of where people get their stocks 
from there isn't this same interchange and i think that um that palette you know that astonishing palette of whiskey flavors that blenders mm -hmm. like richard um have to work with is what makes blending or, or, almost an imperative in scotland because why why wouldn't you and i do think it's interesting that sam's like stuff that you're doing is people looking at taking world whiskies and and so broadening that palette out by looking at, at, at incorporating whiskies from from different geographies into blends and that's probably going to be one of the quite interesting uh things for the for, for the future i think or, albeit it sort of cuts across everyone's whiskey regulations and all that sort of stuff mm. regulations up yours but no I, I i hear that richard on that i mean we're talking about singular distillers i'd love to hear about wolf craig but you know as a master blender and a distiller and now an obe and a master ambassador and someone who's traveled the world and turned thousands and thousands of people onto whiskey and why don't you have a linkedin account uh, sorry say that again why do you have a linkedin account a late what was that again why, why are you on linkedin it's a perfect uh, it backfire thanks nick it's uh, the, the professional network online it's called linkedin are you looking for all work right. all right okay i'll well maybe maybe you can get me to do something i'll i'll certainly try and fit it in just just give me the nod, to Sam. No problem at all. <laughs> well, please, tell, tell us about Wolf Craig. Is Charlie intimated there that, that some, some of these new distilleries will have to be more singular because there isn't the same yeah. lines? So were you about to say something? Sorry. Yeah, Charlie is absolutely correct. All these boutique distilleries are starting off, and uh, yeah, okay. You've got Dalmore established in 1839, the same year as William Grant was born, by the way. Um, but, uh, you know, and then you've got Wolf Creek, which uh, obviously is getting underway, which will uh, be in front of the lovely Sterling Castle. And what are we dependent on? We're dependent on making sure that we get something unique, something dedicated. Now, the first thing, I'm, I'm very privileged to be part of that distillery, but I wouldn't have joined it unless we didn't have a formidable team. You know, we've got Michael Lunn, who was the managing director for many years. We've got, uh, you know, Ian Lockwood, we've got Ian McMillan, you know, distiller there. And of course, we've got Alan Rutherford, Dr. Rather, uh, Dr. Alan Rutherford of Diageo, of course. These are formidable uh, people, but they're passionate people. And that's why we are determined to get our distillation, our double bowl distil distillation underway, the finest cast, the finest water, everything about it. But we're gonna have to work our butts off, just as Charlie has said, the competition is rife. What makes our whiskey different? We're going to have to prove that and get out there and really get that passion. Remember, passion elevates the soul to achieve greater things. And unless you've got that, and I'm not just the bumps, the ups and downs and ups, you've got to keep going forward. And that's our that's our goal to maintain that objective and to make it shine. But we've got to give it one word, time. You cannot hurry uh, producing great whiskey, producing great blends. You must give it time. Now, as I say, I'm studying Johnny Walker just now, 1820. It just didn't happen overnight. It took years. But men with commitment, dedication, the Walkers, the Walker family, they had to really commit to getting their sales guys right. So it, it's a combination of all working as a team. We talk about blended whiskey, bringing in many different component parts. Well, it's the same with any organization. It's not just the master blender. It's everybody coming together to work as a team and to then promote the Scotch whiskey and, of course, ultimately, the Wolf Craig name, which we hope will do. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. That's right. It, it is a long game. It is a patient game. I, I know. I, I know the team you assembled, and I know your. This, like Charlie said, it's all about the stories as well. You have a million yourself, but that whole team is, has millions, millions of hours of tales and all patient enough and people who really intrinsically get whiskey. So I'm sure it will be a success. So look, Richard, congratulations on the OBE. Congratulations on so all the members. And thanks for joining Thank you. Good, good. Have we got time for one story on Burns? Have, have I got time? You know, got, we have lots more time. We're going to go, we're going to do an address to the Haggis next. Um, I'll bring uh, Simon and Franchi back in to raise a glass to you as well. But please share a story. We'll go, we'll go to Australia and then we'll come back and discuss with Rachel and Andrew when they come join us. Okay.
Go ahead, Richard. Yeah, please. What's your story? I'm just going to tell you a very quick story because it's about the address to the haggis. I was asked many years ago to address a few haggises at different places, but the one that does stand out to me, uh, some of you might know this story already, uh, but I was asked to come to The Hague in the Netherlands, and uh, they said, will you make sure, Richard, you dress up and address the haggis properly? And I said, well, um, I actually do it a little bit differently. He said, what do you mean a bit differently? I said, well, I, I don't use a ski and do for my sock. He said, well, what do you use? I said, I use a Bowie knife because Jim Bowie, Bowie of Jura, went to, of course, the Alamo, uh, of course, uh, March 1836, uh, two Scotsmen <laughs> died there. But anyway, that's why I've got a Bowie knife, which I bought in Las Vegas, because that's what's associated. He said, okay. I said, well, what's the problem then? I said, no, there's no problem. Just make sure you bring the haggis in and make sure there's a wooden plinth. Anyway, um, the, the haggis was brought in, pipes and everything, and I it was put in front of me in this haggis. It was a big haggis. And of course, when it came to, and I stabbed it and I went, you know, cut all the trenches open wide and everything else. And, you know, said the last few words and everybody raised a glass and that was it. And then we disappeared. And there was about years, years, years later. And uh, some of my whiskey friends were over in the Netherlands in The Hague. And they happened to say to somebody who actually is a member of the Keepers of the Quake, said, um, do you know Richard Patterson? And they said, do we know Richard Patterson? We can't forget that guy. I said, why is that? Why is that? He took this big Bowie knife, stabbed the haggis, and went through a 15th century silver salver, which we had to, <laughs> to, to, to renovate and everything else. I said, I told you to put the wooden plinth. He said, well, it cost us a bloody fortune. Richard Patterson, <laughs> don't come back again. <laughs> oh, Sam, you're right. you remembered for the wrong reasons, Charlie. Joe, Joe, I'll tell you a very quick story about a, a burnt supper in Aboyne in Aberdeenshire, um, which I, I, I didn't attend, but this friend, friend of mine was the master of ceremonies. <clears throat> and he was doing everything, dressed for the haggis, the mortal memory, the, the whole works, and the... Uh, and it was in, the, it was the, uh, I think it was the conservative club of Arboyne. And the, 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 the burnt supper was being held in what he described as a scout hut, a large scout hut. And there was a stage. And they had, they had, so all the audience were on, on trestle tables, you know, in, in the hall. And the, 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 the guys, the organizers were um, up on the stage with these, these two, uh, tables that were covered with 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 a cloth. Well, it came the, the 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 haggis was piping in, being piped in. The piper was completely pissed, I have to say, and um, and then Rock, my friend, addressed the haggis in full you know, fig, and then gave his dram his quake to the the piper, who turned to the to the audi audience. And drank the quake, and then continued <laughs> right back. And of course, he hit the middle part of the table, so the, the two tables oh, the table collapsed. Everything collapsed, you know. And he, the piper, just lay doggo and was carried out, you know. And of course, the audience thought this was hilarious, you know. And the proceedings went on, but the uh, and I don't know, so must, I, I wish I'd been there. It would have been great fun. <laughs> I've got one gentleman. I don't know if I can share. If I can, share. if we're sharing address to the haggis story, Simon, you know this. We were there together, so uh, we've been fortunate um, that we've managed to go around the world, um, and we thank Robert Burns for that. And we were we were in Monaco. I've dropped some names. This is going to be quite kind of name dropping, right? So we were in Monaco, and we would be, Sam. You were there too. I think you were there for this one That's too. Not a name there. drop, right? <laughs> we're in Monaco. We were doing a Burns night for. His Serene Highness Prince Albert of Monaco Prince and Her Albert, Serene yeah. Highness Princess Charlene of Monaco. And uh, Michael Smith, the Michelin star chef from uh, the Three Chimneys, is it? And Sky? Yeah. Aye, that's right, yeah. Right, so he was the so he was the chef. He was doing the he was doing the food for it. Fantastic food. So it oh. turns out I was it was my it was my um my moment to do the address to the haggis. Simon and I change it each time. 
So it was my my turn to address the Hags. And I was just about to go on. I was backstage and Michael comes up and says, hey, hey, Franchi, um, is there any chance you could use my ski and do instead of your own? I mean, you know, to address the Haggis, it would, you know, mean a lot to me. And I thought nothing of it. I went, yep, yeah, no problem, of course. Mine's on, on, the, on, on, the, on the moment. Right, so we go round and we're piping round, we're walking round. And we stop at the top table. And so there's me, there's Princess Charlene to my right, and then there's uh, His Serene Highness, Prince Albert and Monaco sitting to her right. And we start, you know, uh, fair for your honest on face. Anyway, it gets to that point, it gets to that point, his knife, see rustic labour dicked. So I picked up Michael's knife, right? And it was in, in sheath. And I I went to open it. I went to open it. Right? And it was one of the dummy knives that he didn't tell me. So I'm standing in front of Princess, right next to Princess Charlene, right next to Prince Albert. His knife. His knife. I got it four times. And then I lunged forward and grabbed Princess Charlene's butter knife. And it was at that moment I recognised that the security surrounding the room all moved forward. <laughs> My last address to the haggis. Fortunately, he waved them back, and we managed to get through it. And I'm here to tell the tale. That's but, so wow. hilarious. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Michael. Great story. Yeah. Well, Andy Weir, Rachel McCormack will be joining us for the second half. But right now, let's go to the sloppiest address to a haggis we could expect from our friends Bunton and Blaney from Down Under. What? So it's either going to be the best one you've ever had or the worst one you've ever had. Well, I'm, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I mean, this is my first time. Um, I'm excited. I'm a little bit scared. I want to get it right. I want to do Robert Burns justice with it. But I suppose, I mean, it's about having fun as well, isn't it? It's yeah, of course. Fun and enjoying yeah, ourselves and having a whiskey. And, and you furnished this with a lovely haggis here, Ross. We have a haggis here. Yeah, it's been freshly caught. Freshly caught. Um, I've been outside and catching this wild haggis. The last, last 20 minutes. Right. Behind the bins, by no. the looks of it. I said I found it near the bins, not by the bins. And, you know, it's been out in the wild. I mean, this is this is Australia. Haggis don't hang out in the same places as they do in Scotland. No, so we have to look in different places. They're treated with vermin. But, but we have a haggis. We have and a haggis. we're very lucky to have it. <laughs> so we've got a whiskey as well, which is good. We have whiskey. So we're ready. We have haggis. We're ready so this go. is Ross and I's rendition of uh, the Ode to the Haggis, which is about, you know, what haggis means to Scottish people and about how... It's a, a good filler, and it'd be good to have before battle. In fact, people would meet the under the salt uh, cross mm. and have their haggis before they went to battle. Yeah, and I mean, I'm quite looking forward to eating this one after we finish here as well. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so this is our rendition of the Ode to the Haggis. Yes. Uh, would you like to kick us off, Mr. Burton? Please kick us off. I think you should right. kick us off. I've never done this with someone else, so it's it, you usually do all the lines in a row. It so I'm. Um, We'll make it work. We'll make it work. I'm reading off this anyway. All right, okay. Fair far, your honest sonsy face, great chieftain at the button race. A boon am I, you tat your place, pinch stripe for verm. Well, are you worthy o a grace as langs my erum? The groaning trencher, there you fill. Your hurt is like a distant hill. Your pen would help to mend a mill in time of need. Well, through your pores, the Jews distill like amber bead. His knife, see rustic, labour dick. That's, that's not a knife. Come on. That's what skin do. Hey, this is a knife. This is a knife. Hey, you always got here. a bigger one than us. Oh, can I use this? Please use my knife, oh, yes. Thank you very much. His knife, see rustic, labour dick. And cut ye up with ready slick. Facing your gushing entrails prick like honey ditch, and then a water glorious sicked, warm, reeking, and rich. They always squeak like that as well, that's normal. That's, they always squeak. I yeah. didn't expect that. <laughs> then horn for horn they stretch and strive, they'll tack the hindmost on they drive, till all their wheels while kites be alive. Our bent lit drums. And then old Gidman <coughs> may slight derive, but thank it hums. Then horn oh that was your line, wasn't it? So my line is <laughs> Is there 
Is there the hour this French ragu or olio that would stow a sou or fricassee would make her spew? Looks doon, mosquito, scornful you on sick of dinner. Poor devil, CMO is trash, as feckless as a withered rash, his spindle shank a good whip lash, his knee a nip. Through bloody flood or field to dash, oh how unfit. But mark, the rustic hag is fed, the trembling earth resounds his tread, clapped in his wally knee a blade, he'll mark it whistle, and legs and arms and heads will sned, like taps a thistle. Watch that. I'm, 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 I'm always worried. <laughs> you pearls, one mark, mankind your care, and dish them out their bill of fare. Old Scotland wants nay skinking wear that jouts in luggies. But if you wish a grateful prayer, get a haggis. Get a haggis. Get a haggis. No. That might not have been exactly as Robbie intended it to be done. Slightly different from the original version. Yeah. I'm sure they had a better haggis as well, but we did our ah, best. This is a great wild haggis. It's, it, it's a haggis. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for inviting us along thank to do this wee bit for you. I yep. got Andy Weir's on this. Andy Weir's going to go, that's that. Because uh, he, he does go to the haggis and he, he's good at it. He's good at it. So he's going to go, that's yeah. terrible. Yeah. But, you know, what the hell? It's a different version. But yeah, we hope exactly. we've done it justice. We hope you guys have enjoyed it. Uh, it's very nice to share a whiskey with you guys, and we hope to be invited back again next time. Probably we'll not! We'll see how After it After we spent all the money in these bloody candles! <laughs> no, we've got no budget left. <laughs> anyway, cheers, Happy guys. Happy Burns Night, guys. Burns night Have a you. good one. All the best to everybody overseas. Cheers. We love you, and we hope to see you soon. Slanjava. Cheers. Oh, there it is again. Oh, I like that one, Dave. <laughs> Well, Andy Weir is here. Andy, thanks a lot for joining us. Richard, glad you time. And yeah, open <laughs> gear haggis, gear haggis. Thanks for joining us, Andy. Good to be here. Good to be here. Sam, the last time I was here, I was fighting the elements of a setting sun on a southern facing window in, in my house here in New York. Uh, so today, I've taken great extreme lengths. I've got blackout curtains, I've got candles. <laughs> I'm, I'm really trying my best to get in the fireside chat mode. So do I meet your approval? I think you've obviously given Bunton similar feedback. <laughs> well, listen, well, I, I love how enthusiastically you've taken it on board. And I can say I had a preliminary call with Richard, too. And you can see Richard Patterson embraced the deck for your background. <laughs> <laughs> I see a Robbie hiding out in the background there as well. Oh, no. I, mean, I see you have Robbie, too. Suits the Simon's, occasion. Got, Simon's got a view Robbie Burns picture there, right? Yes. Gentlemen, how was the address? How, how would we rate Bunton and Blaney? Well, um, some of Richard's terminology about passion. Mm -hmm. I think when um, two gentlemen such as um, Ross and James um, clearly, you know, led with passion, I think it would be very unfair to critique them on the quality of their address. <laughs> And obviously the measure of their personality and the strength of their passion was obviously in abundance. I mean, my mother said to me, Simon, just do your best. And I'm sure their mothers would be very proud of that address. <laughs> wow. Talk that diplomacy, Richard. Fantastic. No, what, what is so good is they did it in a good, friendly manner. And that's what it's about. It brought a bit of fun. Uh, you know, when people go off the QOE but but they got a big knife, long knife. The haggis was a bit queer, mind you, but we won't go into that one. But there was a sort of noise of a, I don't know, like a balloon going off. But anyway, uh, but they did it proud, as Simon said, proud. I feel like I'm being, I feel like I'm being positioned as the uh, as the Bruno Don Corleone. Uh, judge in, in this situation, uh, especially in a pre-recorded video, Bunton already set me up to critique it. Um, my, my, my take on my take on any kind of burns is always uh, that anybody who's willing to give it a go and have fun with it and not take it too seriously is going to bring another person along into the world of burns. It's a wee bit like whiskey, actually. For too long, we've allowed 
uh, people to be the arbiters of whiskey and to build these rules and barriers and and make it our drinking. You, you know, we don't want anybody to come in and you, you know you can't drink it this way or that way. And that just makes people go down the the aisle in the shop or into the bar and say, "Just give me a Tito's and soda." I I, I can't. My head can't even take the rules. Uh, and I think Burns has actually suffered from a very similar. Uh, effect. I think people have uh, have grown up so, somewhat ambivalent to Burns. They can't say the words, so they just move on and, and do something a bit easier. Maybe Dickens. Um, so I think any, you know, obviously James has done it a ton of times. And by the way, he told a fib because he and I have done it together in Ballinella Castle. Obviously more memorable for me than it was for him. <laughs> <laughs> I think you make a great point. Well said. And we've we've been sharing. Thanks for joining us. I know you're in New York time, and you've you've done the blackout blinds and paid attention to all the details and the friendly uh, constructive builds. Um, <laughs> we've shared a little bit. Each of us, our connections or our histories with Burns. I know you have one that resonates in all sorts of ways, and uh, you are my credible Burns friend. Could you <laughs> could you illuminate us? What's what's your connection to Burns? What's Burns to you? Well, much like Simon, uh, Simon and I grew up very close to each other. Him, obviously, uh, ahead of me uh, by some years. Um, <laughs> and then the posh, and then the posh part of town. But Simon, Simon grew up in Alloway, where you know, very posh. They, they get out of the bath to pee in Alloway. Uh, <laughs> very posh part of town. And uh, so, so Simon and I grew up in the same part of the world. I grew up a couple of miles from Burns Cottage. Uh, Simon grew up a couple of feet from Burns Cottage, um, and so when you when you live in Ayr, when you live in Ayrshire, Burns is is a piece of your a big piece of your education. Uh, in some ways, it's the first time a child is given the chance to express themselves. Uh, you're handed a piece of Burns at five or six years old and told you're entering the Burns competition. And you know, I wasn't a particularly studious child. I wasn't academic. But something about Burns just really resonated with me. My grandmother and both sides of my family actually are from, are from the villages, the, the mining villages in Ayrshire. So they spoke in the real broad uh, Scots tongue. And so it was a familiar language to me. So it, it felt right. I, my grandmother would talk to me in this language. Uh, so I actually probably could read Burns or speak and perform Burns before I could read. Uh, and when you live in Ayr, everything from a bus stop to a chip shop is named after Burns. Uh, so th there's no escaping this guy. You visit the cottage every year on Burns Night. Uh, so that's really where my love affair started. I was good at it. I wasn't good at anything else. Uh, and eventually, when I was about six or seven years old, I would be rolled out into these bowling club burn suppers uh, as this kind of uh, almost a, a curiosity. Here's this wee boy. He knows all the words to Holy Willie's Prayer. Let's hear what he's got to say. Uh, and so I'd be up there with the with the with the, with the, with the worthies. Uh, and then I would compete, and then you know, and, uh, but when I was about sixteen or seventeen, I won the uh, the, the national uh, recitation prize, the, the Burns competition, which is entered by one hundred eighty-two thousand people in those days. Uh, so it was just it was something that I, I really engaged with, uh, and I wouldn't say I'm a Burns scholar uh, as much as an enthusiast and somebody who you know, takes a challenge always to interpret Burns in a way that people will sit and smile, or nod their head, or laugh. Or say, wow, that was that was meaningful. So that's that's my relationship. Yeah, it's lovely. Great. Well, and we've also we've been discussing, and guys jump in whenever, but we've been discussing the parallel, and you've already alluded to it, the parallel sort of global impact of uh, of Scotch whiskey and Burns. And you you're on that picture. You're a Scot in New York working with Scotch whiskey. <clears throat> yeah, and it's been great actually the last couple of years with Aberlour, I've been able to because my job has taken me back out of the office for a while. I've been back traveling and uh, I've been able to kind of bring the Burns thing back in, but in, in new ways, you know, not not settling for the, the obvious when it comes to, to Burns stuff. Uh, I still do a lot of uh, speaking, like I've, I, I would often be called on to dress up as Burns and appear on government websites and all kinds of random stuff. Uh, I'm not as much sure videos, but I am now officially too old to play Burns. I'm three years older than he was when he died. So I'm I'm kind of hanging up my my wig, um, but yeah, it has this it has this enormous international appeal. Uh, Scottish people, uh, we we have a real a really good knack of of knocking ourselves and and, and the things that we're good at. Uh, you know, not what would you call a well balanced Scotsman? Or how do you know you got well balanced Scotsman? Get a chip on both shoulders. Uh, 
<laughs> we, we, like to, we like to knock things that we're good at. We're getting better. I think we're getting a wee bit more proud of, of our accomplishments. And Burns was one of those things, you know, it's like you talk to someone in, in Glasgow about going up to the Hebrides or to Orkney or Shetland and they talk about it like it's outer space. You know, look up there in the Helens and Helens, you know, it's, it's a three hours in the car. It's beautiful. And I, I think my relationship with Burns was always the same. I was trying to explain to Scottish people how popular and how successful Burns is. One really quick anecdote. Uh, in 2004, I was backpacking around, 2003, I was backpacking around the world. And uh, I was, I'd rented this motorcycle tour guide. I'd hired him for the day. $2 was his fee for the day. His name was Jack Ty. I'll never forget him as long as he lived. He spoke 12 languages. And he drove me around Phnom Penh in, in Cambodia for a whole day. And I learned more from that guy in eight hours than I have from most people I've ever met in my life. <laughs> now, Jack drove me around. I'd lost my friends. He was trying to reunite me with them. And we pulled over at the side of the road to take a picture, I think, of the killing fields or something uh, very kind of profound like that. And his phone rang. And the ringtone on his phone was all Lang Syne. <laughs> and he knew every word. So just as a Scottish person, as you're walking down a main road somewhere in Taipei or Beijing, and you see a Johnny Walker poster on, on the on the billboard, and you get a wee moment of pride, and you think, that's from Kilmarnock, or that's from Elgin, or, or, or Dufton, or wherever. Yeah. And you, you, you get that wee flutter when you hear Old Lang Syne on a motorcycle tour guide's ringtone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's amazing. Perfect, perfect, Vernia, for the global connection and the, uh, the testament to the endurance and the permanence and penetration of both Scotch whiskey and Burns' legacy. Again, this is not a Burns supper. Obviously, we're not doing that tonight. We're just, we're just talking about the legacy of Burns and warming you all up for Burns suppers you may be attending or conducting yourselves over the next few weeks. Next week, I should say. Sam, Thanks. Sam, can I just say to you, because, uh, you know, when Andy was resonating about how well-known Burns is around the world, I'll never forget going to Canada in Montreal. And uh, I remember it was so cold. It was a minus 20. And everybody, of course, was underneath in the shops below in the malls. And we went down there because we had been for a walk and just we had to we had to heat ourselves up. So we went down to the mall and uh, we were asking our way. And I said to, to this gentleman, uh, you know, where's the mall? We went to get some books and said, what are you looking for? I said, well, actually, I want to get another book on Burns. And he went, who? I said, Robert Burns. Who's Robert Burns? I said, he's one of Scotland's greatest poets. Burns. I've never heard of him. I said, to him, well, why don't you get off your backside and go above and you'll see a statue of him. He's asked out there. <laughs> there you are. So you guys in Montreal better wake it up. <laughs> Richard, more statues, more statues of Burns than any other non-religious figure apart from Queen Victoria and Christopher Columbus around the world. Yeah. So uh, he did something right. Christopher Columbus set off 3rd of August, 1492, 12th of October, New World. Sail the ocean blue. Sail the ocean blue, yeah. The winds. At the the don't, don't go <laughs> Sam. <laughs> That's that's the Richard Patterson we love. That's that's the showman. But right now, this is this is fireside. This is casual, being with one another, the coziness. I think it's story time. We've been doing this. This is the third time we've done this. We did it for Bonfire Night. We did it for Christmas. I would talk about John Walker because obviously Nick recently published a truly excellent and an insightful book about about Johnny Walker that actually, incidentally, Nick is beautifully written. Thank you. Yeah. But let's. Uh, <clears throat> Maybe it's the time from Dr. Nick. Okay, well, I've got I've just got a story to tell, which is about Kilmarnock, which a Andy mentioned, and, and it's about um, Alexander Walker, the son of John. It's about this little book <coughs> called Kilmarnock Edition, published in 1786, and it's about the celebrations of, of the centenary of the publication. Of, of the Kilmarnock edition that took place in August 1886 in, in Kilmarnock. Um, and it was a huge event for the town. It was an uh, absolutely huge event. Um, 
And um, it was said that over 30 or 40,000 people gathered in K Park, which both Andy and Simon will know, I'm, I'm sure, in, in, in one side of Kilmarnock, which has got a beautiful statue of Burns right at the top of the hill there. There'd been massive parades through, uh, through the town with um, horse and carts and people doing tableaus of different poems on the, on, the, on the back of the carts as they went through the town. And then there was a speeches, concerts, and then big dinner, of course, in the, uh, in the evening. And Alexander Walker, who was a very benevolent character, um, or, 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 albeit he was a sort of gruff fellow, but um, he, he could never say no to anyone who asked him for help or assistance, if it, whether it was money or, or sort of personal influence, whatever it might be. But Alexander Walker got involved and decided that he would pay to bring up to Kilmarnock to perform at the, uh, at the centenary the pipe band of the Royal Caledonian Asylum in London. And the Royal Caledonian Asylum in London was not an asylum as we would understand it. It was a school that had been set up uh, originally for Scottish children who'd been orphaned during the Napoleonic Wars. And it carried on really as a sort of military focused school, but always with that emphasis on people of kids of, of Scottish um, parentage. And here's a London story for anyone that's in London listening. Um, it moved out of central London uh, up, up to Islington. And the reason that the Caledonian Road in Islington is called the Caledonian Road is because of the Royal Caledonian Asylum. So Alexander Walker got involved in trying to um, trying to get the pipe band up. And I'm just going to read you a few extracts from the letters because it's like a wonderful sort of uh, cameo of what was going on. So that you he know, wrote, Nick, Rachel's here. Rachel's here now and Rachel is listening. Thanks for joining us, Rachel. I'll bring you in now. No pressure to present just yet, but Nick's reading us a story. So pour a dram and join us by the fire. Hi, Rachel. Yeah. So um, in July... Uh, in July 1886, uh, Alexander Walker was, was, was getting a bit pissed off with the arrangements and the trouble he was having to go to to, get, to make this pipe band thing happen. Um, and he was getting particularly irritated with a man called Thomas Inglis, who was the secretary of the, of the school in London. And he wrote to Alexander Walker, wrote to his manager in London, I wired you this morning asking definite information as to when the pipers are to be here. I am greatly perplexed as to how I am to get on, how I am to get on with that blethering bitch English. I think Burns would have liked blethering bitch. It sort of comes off the tongue rather well. That blethering bitch English, as I'm afraid I am very likely to lose my temper with such loquacious gentlemen. So you get a sense that there's some tension in the background here, you know, in, in the arrangements. Anyway, as it turned out, the boys the boys came up. Uh, they played in the parade. They then played in a very long concert uh, in the uh, in the afternoon in K Park, and then for a couple of days, Alexander Walker and his people toured them around Ayrshire, and they went to Alloway and they visited uh, various uh, Dundonald Castle and places like that. So they did the whole Ayrshire Burns thing before going back to um, before going back to. Uh, Going, going back to London. Uh, but it was cl clearly a great strain for, uh, for Mr. Walker. Thank goodness, thank goodness I have got rid of the demonstration at last and I'm off on a yachting cruise tomorrow, which I expect will last about a week. I did, I did what I could to make the pipers happy and comfortable and I believe the boys go home with a good feeling as regards Scotland. It is a pity that the man who pays the piper should have to suffer so much. <laughs> I need not add more on this subject, but I am very well pleased it is all over, and I shall think twice before I enter, en enter into anything of it like again. He was then, only a few days later, somewhat chastised to receive a letter from Mr. Inglis in London, the blethering bitch, which was fulsome <laughs> in praise and thanks to Alexander Walker for everything he'd done. So he wrote to English, I have your very kind letter, which was agreeable, and I was agreeably surprised at its contents. I had no idea you were going to make so much of the visit, which was quite as much enjoyed by me as it was by you. <laughs> I have to thank the directors 
through you for their kindness in recognizing the small part I took in the matter. And I can tell you, I never before paid the piper with such hearty goodwill. <laughs> and so, and so, so it goes on. And then they started sending him presents, and it all went, it all went a bit over the top. Well, I thought it was a classic story of how he got involved in something and really badly regretted it. But but what does come through, you know, is just this huge passion uh, in, in the Walker had. I mean, he was a great Burns scholar and a Burns fan. Uh, and that the whole town had for this celebration, which was clearly one of the biggest things, if not the biggest thing that had ever happened in Kilmarnock to that date. Wonderful. Thanks, Dr. Nick. That's great. Rachel, I'm really glad you could join us. Thank you. I was fearing for a moment that this was going to turn into a burn supper from 1904 with <laughs> sat around a fire. I was. It was one of those weird things. I was actually hosting an online class for making shoe pastry, and it was taking much longer than everybody expected. So I've just left a load of people in aprons munching away with on creme patisserie and cream, oh. and and I was watching them while drinking water. When I was quite upset about that, so at least I'm here with with my people. At least you know we've all got the same thing, and I'm not watching you all eat eclairs. And well, I've just been sitting drinking water. But I thought well, it would go on for two hours, but it ended up going on for three because everything was taking longer. So sorry, no, please, so no, not to worry at all. I'm I'm delighted you bump those off and and came to join us. We're, we'll, we'll continue for a few minutes more, probably half an hour more, but I'd love to speak to you a bit to make up for lost time because we, we've discussed a lot of different things that maybe you would have some insight into. I know, first of all, Chasing the Dram, some people might know Rachel McCormick from a, a really brilliant, actually laugh out loud in my case, uh, book about about Scotch whiskey. and Well, about much more than that, but um, there's something related to, to Burns, I think, that I think um, resonates with the book. If you haven't read the book, colleagues of mine, a colleague of mine, Jen, who's watching, it's her favorite book on whiskey, and she's read plenty in, in her research for dealing with me and working in this industry. Um, it, it, it is kind of, well, that is very kind of her to say. I have to say, it isn't, it, the reason I kind of wrote it like that was because it's for people that don't know about whiskey. And it was what I thought was, I was kind of the gateway like I would open the doors and then you would get to Charlie and then you would get to Dave and then you would get to Nick because, you know, they know more in their little finger about whiskey than I will ever know. And yeah. so my book was very much an outsider's view of going around Scotland and looking at whiskey. Also, somebody gave me money to go around whiskey distillers and get drunk and write about it. I mean, come on. <laughs> you were going to say no to that. Who is going to say no to that? So, you know. No, but again, it's like what Richard was speaking about earlier, and like we were speaking about this. This, this industry does bring people in. So your, your book certainly does that. It certainly did that for my colleague and for many others. Uh, but even as a whiskey nerd myself, it was laugh out loud funny. And just the idea that I think that resonates with tonight is what we've been speaking about in terms of uh, if we if we were to view Burns as just a poet and not something much more, we view whiskey as just a drink. Your book never treats whiskey as just a drink. It's so much more. It's bound in the cultural history of a of a country and the fabric of, of the of the people, um, for good, for better or for worse. Um, so you're doing shoe pastry tonight. Um, what, what burn what burns to you? Where where did you first come in contact with with Robert Burns? Well, I think like most people, um, I think everybody here who's Scottish would probably agree with me. They probably had a traumatized childhood at primary school when they had to recite a poem in a class competition for the Burns Federation, and then if you got really good, you then had to be on the stage and recite the Burns poem to the whole school. And then you got a better colour certificate from the Burns Federation. <laughs> and that was all we did with Burns every year. So I think Burns, it just, it's a quite a strange thing. Scottish people don't think, they kind of, I don't think Scottish people realise how different it is that our big national day is about a poet as opposed to a saint. And, you know, one thing Burns was definitely not in any way, shape or form was a saint. <laughs> so it, it's a really, I think, I think it's a really interesting thing that we, we you know, again, so there are things about Scotland that are quite unusual that people, Scottish people don't really realise. You know, if you look at the Irish and St. Patrick's Day, or if you look at the Spanish and any of the patron saints of, of their city, you know, St. Andrew's Day, we just all sit about, you know, Burns night where everybody's running about in kilts and singing songs and eating haggis and getting drunk. It, it is kind of like we have a poet instead of a saint. Very but good. That, 
Well, that says something too, doesn't it, everyone? I mean, that, that says something yeah. about who we celebrate. Yeah. About, we, who, who, who Scots celebrate as representative and the, who, what resonates with the Scottish <clears throat> You know, Sam, I, I, I couldn't agree more, Rachel. I, I, and I've never actually, in all my years of, of working with Burns, I've never even thought of it like that. Uh, I, I, living in America for 16 years, I've always been a wee bit of an, a, a, you know, a grump when it comes to St. Patrick's Day because, you know, I worked with the family for 40 years and uh, 17th of March they'd be warming up Scotland Brave on the Great Highland Bagpipe walking out, up the street in Royal Stuart Tartan. Uh, and everyone's like, isn't it great to be Irish? And I would always kind of talk about Celtic confusion. Um, but but at least they figured it out. You know, they've, they've figured out a way to take their greatest assets, even if some of them aren't theirs, and use them to, to promote their country around the world. I think it's amazing and, and it should be uh, applauded, uh, but yeah, when it when it comes to Burns Night, we we don't really res we don't take it seriously enough. I don't think in some ways. I mean, I, th I actually think it's growing in popularity than, than it was uh, when we were younger. It was, um, but no, I, th I think you make a really good point, and I think um, whiskey is it's, it's always a good time with whiskey. Uh, tourism does a decent job, um, but we we have we have some great culture to to take to the world, and Burns gives us that platform. But I think also with whiskey, I mean, was one of the premises of my book was I, you know, I spent my 20s in Spain. So a lot of my kind of big formation as an adult was reading Spanish books. And one of the really big things I think about the Spain that I read about was very much, I mean, I was there in the late 90s and, the, and it was a very much a 70s and 80s Spain. And I think what had happened with the Spanish, because Franco had been so terrible, the Spanish have kind of drawn into just having a good time was kind of a survival strategy. And one of the writers, the writers that I really admired as a food writer was a guy called Nestor Lohan. And it turned out that Nestor Lohan was a journalist and he kept getting uh, censored by the, Franco, by the Franco regime whenever he was writing anything. So he kind of gave up trying to write the great novel or being a political writer and sort of retreated into having a good time and writing about food. But his way of writing about food was very much, it struck me, it was the way that a lot of people like yourselves all think about whiskey. His way of writing about food was very much, this is fantastic and I am having a great time and you can join me having this great time. And if one of the things I remember him writing about a restaurant in, in Peniscola, just in the north of Valencia, it was you have this lunch by the sea and after lunch you're having your coffee and you're having a brandy and you just want your life to last as long as possible so that you can come back and do this again and again and you hear people people in scotland don't talk about that like that about food very very few people do very rarely even people that aren't big whiskey geeks they talk about whiskey like that you know they talk about going somewhere like a distillery and having a whiskey or going to a pub and drinking a special whiskey and it really is to me what whiskey to, in Scotland is what sort of gastronomy and food is in Spain in a way that we don't appreciate food in the way that we appreciate whiskey. Also the thing I find really interesting about it is the lack of class. You know if you tell a, a buying a good bottle of whiskey in Scotland just means you've got more money. It doesn't mean that you're nest what it doesn't it's not a class signifier the way Something like an Otto Lange book is a class signifier in Scotland, or an expensive bottle of Bordeaux is still a class signifier in Scotland. Buying a good malt just means you've got the money to buy it. And again, that's something that I don't think Scottish people see either. Mm. Ah, great, Rachel. Great. Well, do you do you think I'm talking nonsense or do you do you agree, Charlie? I, mean, that's I agree with you hundred percent, hundred percent. The the uh, it's a very agitarian, <coughs> and that I think is why. <coughs> excuse me. The um, you know these great festivals all over the world. Um, you know, Scotch is it's it, the. It, it, but it is the most agitarian. This is back to Burns as well as well. I mean mm -hmm. the the most agitarian. Um, you don't get beer festivals. You don't get wine wine festival wine shows are entirely different. There's, there's a sort of snobbery about wine. Um, and the, um, but the whiskey, we were talking about just earlier on, actually, these these huge festivals all, all around the world. And you don't even know who people are, but it doesn't matter because they, we're, just, we're just enthusiastic 
passionate. They, we are about passionate about whiskey. Yeah. And, and it's, I, it's an extraordinary thing. Mm. I find that about the industry. I find it I find it an interesting industry to sort of look kind of look in from the outside. And um, the thing I found it as well was the lack of the, the lack of kind of class structure around it in Britain, which is very unusual. And I also find the lack of sexism for all that I would quite often be in a room where there was very few women and nobody ever felt unwelcome in a room right. full of whiskey geeks. When you read the problems that women have in the whiskey industry, it's always from outsiders and visitors mm -hmm. making assumptions within the industry. Or if you go into a room full of whiskey geeks at a whiskey club, I've never seen women feel anything other than welcome. Absolutely. And I I have done wine trade tastings and wine trade tastings in London are not like that. In any <laughs> way. They yeah, are really yeah. And I think that's a thing that the whiskey industry really does need to slap itself on the back for. Yes, there is lots more work to do to have more get more women in, be more inclusive. But I and I do think, you know, recent events with some things that have happened, you can really see it was really interesting to watch how quickly the whisk industry stepped up and went, ah, I've had enough of this. It's time we moved on. And I, I, that was really different. I mean, there was a friend of mine who's a journalist in London. She came up for a weekend and we we, we, we did some things with her. I think we, we had dinner one night with Annabelle and Nick. And she turned around to me at one point and she said to me, look, I have to say this to you. Either this is the best industry in the world to work in or this is a cult. I don't know what it is, but it's one of the two. <laughs> <laughs> it's a cult, Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> but that was—I mean, that, I suppose again, that was the thing with me about my book was was it was about looking into the outside and kind of, and after a while, you realise, you know, you kind of start, you, you go with a whiskey geek to a whiskey distillery, and they're all looking at the Swan necks of the, of you know, they look at the Swan necks, they look at the size of the still, and they're all getting excited about the barrel room, and you're like, these people are freaks. And then after about three months, you're going, oh, look at that neck, and oh, look at that still, oh, look at those barrels. You're like, oh, God, I've joined them. But it it's, is. it's the best fun. I think, you know, to, I, th I would imagine to work in full time, but also to to be on the edge of and enjoy drinking, and enjoy being with people. It is probably the best drinks industry that there is because people keep asking what my next book will be, and I'm like, well, what other drinks industry can I write about? It's like, I've, you know, I've gone to the best one. What we're going to do now? Write about... <laughs> Beer. I don't think you know. No, why would I do that? Hey, hey Rachel, you you made some great points. First of all, the whiskey industry is officially the best industry to work in. And I can't imagine oh. working anywhere else. You get stuck because it's that good and it's full of interesting people. Um, and I agree with all the points you made. Um, I think uh, burn suppers, for example, used to always be seen as a stag all male thing, and, mm. and I, I was clued into that quite young, and I used to just refuse to do them. And I would have people say, but this is 1,200 people are coming to this. is the biggest burn supper in the world. I'd say, it doesn't matter. I mean, I, I'm of the belief that Burns wouldn't want to go uh, to a room that didn't have any women in it uh, for a start. And, you know, I, I can't think of anything more boring than a bunch of men in a room, you know. So, but that's the point about whiskey. The other point I was going to make about Burns being egalitarian, I can't imagine another figure of literature, let alone a figure of 18th century literature, who has such a broad coalition as Burns has. Shakespeare doesn't have a broad coalition. Shakespeare doesn't have working class people skipping down the street, you know, apart from maybe Romeo and Juliet and some of the, the more known things. I have presented Burns everywhere from royal palaces to the Orient Express to uh, bowling clubs and working man's clubs and uh, drug and alcohol treatment facilities and old folks' homes. And to a person, you can hear a pin drop with certain verses of Burns. And, and everyone... Uh, they might interpret it in their own way, but they all interpret it. And it's a bit like opera. People say, oh, how do you understand the old Scots? You understand the feeling behind it. Mm -hmm. And and it is, Charlie, you said it, it is egalitarian. You, people people get burns, and it's a very levelling thing, uh, as, as I think sometimes whiskey is too. I think the thing with burns as well is is kind of in the modern world. Um, he was one of the, you know, the big debates in other places that speak English, other kind of smaller places that speak English, like in the Caribbean, they, when they started prop, so properly trying to create a kind of Caribbean literary culture, there was a big debate about whether they all wrote in English or whether they all, they wrote the way they spoke. And Burns was a huge, big influence on them of, look at how big he is still in Scotland. And he wrote the way people spoke. Yes, he could write English. Yes, he could speak English, but he wrote in Scots the way people 
actually spoke in his hometown. And if he's doing that, then we should we should be claiming that for ourselves. And you know, there are people, I mean, I think a lot of times they're now in their 70s and 80s, but they were the people who were really fundamental with uh, Caribbean literature in the Anglophile Caribbean. And they were really, they looked to, they really looked to Burns as the standard of what they could do and what they could aim to do with their own language and their own literature. And so I think, you know, that I think that's a really, I think it's a really important thing as well. It's not just what he can do in Scotland or what he can do on a Burns night. It's what is that legacy for places that you wouldn't even imagine Burns's legacy could be? I just have to say, Andy, uh, as I was brought up in, uh, where's Andy gone? He's still there. As I was brought up in Stratford-upon-Avon, I have to sort of speak up for, for William Shakespeare and uh, the great William Shakespeare birthday parades and stuff we used to have. And I think it's, I, I don't think one of them is better than the other. They're, they're quite different in many respects. And I think they both actually had a very common reach because if you see Shakespeare performed as it would have been performed with all the jokes done as they should properly be done. I mean, yeah. it's pretty, pretty raunchy humour going on behind kings and queens and heaven knows what else, you know. Yeah, it's a very fair point. Um, I, I mean, I, I think maybe it's it's the way that modern culture has made it a bit more elitist. Yeah, I think so. More, more than what Shakespeare wrote. Uh, and it's about, again, back to who who makes, who appoints themselves, yeah. the arbiters. And if you make it a kind of snooty West End of London, uh, you know, social scene, then maybe that's going to be a, li a little bit uh, isolating to certain people. Absolutely, I agree. And the other thing I would say, Andy, I was introduced, I was lucky to be introduced to Burns when I first started coming up to Scotland, before I was in the whiskey business, and I was taken round Ayrshire, I went to all the places and all of that stuff, and got, got to understand some of the poetry. And, and then, foolishly, I went to a burn supper, and I was just destroyed. I couldn't believe this sort of misogynistic nightmare that I'd uh, stepped into as someone's someone's guest and the whole thing was ghastly and it, it, I've never been to one since to be honest as I just said right well m my experience of Burns is not that it's with friends it's doing things like this it's enjoying uh whiskey and it's enjoying actually nice Scottish food in in good company but good lord how how anyone was ever taken over and and bastardized in the way that those burn suppers did was really it's terrible it was it was, it was the Masons, you know, I mean, yeah. Scotland is it, kind of still run too much by the Masons. It was it's just like being, a, I felt, at, at, at a Masonic meeting or an Orange Lodge or, you know, heaven knows what, yeah. but I mean, it was just, it's, it's like I mean, a I think, I, think, I, I, mean I think that there's a thing that, you know, that's the thing I suppose you find quite interesting, how the whiskey industry is different, um, because in the end, it's not really sexist in Scotland. It's quite backward and sexist, and nowhere can you see that better than still far too many Burns nights. But you still can get a really good Burns night if you're determined. I mean, I have sat once. What I went to once one in my York up with my dad and his pals because my dad. It was all these bloody pensioners all in my York all decided they were going to have a Burns night. So somebody decided to pour the whiskey because they didn't want to give everybody a full bottle. So they poured the whiskey into wine carafes, which meant everybody drank it like it was wine. <laughs> and then oh, they're, all make, they're all making speeches and then the top table they ended up having they, they didn't have any bagpipers so they just put something on the telly that didn't work but then they had these Norwegians who had somehow arrived in Porto Poyenza and they decided that we better invite the Norwegians because they're from the north too and they only could only sit at the top table because all the rest of the tables were full and then somehow I ended up organising with a Norwegian about how we could really do a Bollywood version of Pierre Gint with Burns poetry and a happy ending and make it nothing wow. like. And it just and it was just really, really good fun. And they were just watching kind of people making speeches. I know, and then the response, the lassie's response was by a jazz singer who said that she wasn't going to do the response unless somebody paid her. So they just gave her lots of whiskey and then she decided she was going to do the response and it was just a song. And it was really good fun. I mean, and I do think I do think it's like it's kind of time we claim Burns back from the yep. masons. I was going to say that exact same thing. I ran a company for years called Third Degree Burns, and we uh -huh. travelled around the world doing kind of accessible Burns nights. And uh, John Murta was my partner in crime, who's who's an older actor, uh, 
well known in, in, in Scottish uh, circles, but we, we would we would try and kind of defeat the old idea of the patriotic format of a Burns night. And sometimes we would get bad feedback because people well, we were expecting to sing the yeah. Star of Rabbi Burns at the end. I can't think of anything worse than standing up in chairs singing the Star of Rabbi Burns. So I think it's incumbent on people like us who love Burns and who want to, to your point, to reclaim it from this kind of whiskery old bore at the top table. I was doing burn suppers at six or seven years old and I'd be at the top table. And it was so intimidating. It was all a bunch of old men who were either elected officials or good golfers or good rugby players. I remember seeing a guy with a stack of pages that high and he was doing the immortal memory. And he turns around to me and he says, listen, son, let me give you some advice. The immortal memory does not need to be funny. And I looked at the stack of pages and I could feel the will to live ebbing from my soul. Yeah. I remember uh, years ago, Andy, when you're talking about that, I was invited uh, to this police federation. I don't know, 600 people there. And uh, it was a very official affair. And I addressed the haggis and I got so passionate about addressing it that I missed two verses out and finished it up, etc. But see, by missing these two verses out, that was it. Richard Patterson, get off. We don't want to see you again. And you went out saying there was a ticket in your car? <laughs> was it? Yeah. 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 Speeding offence, get that Patterson guy. But it was unbelievable. But, you know, what Rachel said and what you said, many of these people in that audience hadn't a blinking clue about the words that were being expressed. But that's what it's all about. It's the way in which you tell it, the way in which you convey it from your body, from your eyes, the softness of your voice that really brings out the very best. You might not understand the words, but the way that you speak it, the way that Rabbi wanted you to say it, it that's the essence of Robert Burns. Well, surprise is worse than disappointment. <laughs> Pamela Shanter, let's get to Simply Whiskey's performance. If Richard and, and Rachel and Charlie and Nick, Andrew, if you need to jump off, I know I told you it'd be two hours. You got a Tamil Shanter, an absolutely brilliant performance. I've, I've seen them rehearse it. They've done it around the world. They've done it online for the Whiskey Exchange, and it's it, it really it will it will uh, it will wow you. But hang around for that. We'll then we'll then raise a toast and uh, get out of here before we can all go to bed. Okay. Have you are you going to explain to people that don't know exactly what this because the story of Tamil Shanter is? Well, someone's going. I'm sorry, oops, that was abrupt. I'm really sorry, Rachel. I'm uh, learning how to use my computer. It's all quite new to me. I do apologize. Simply Whiskey, Simon, Franchi, thanks for your patience, guys. And that was, I mean, I, thank God Rachel arrived. She got my text 30 minutes ago. Like, hey, Rachel, I just know we will be explaining. We will be explaining yeah. the uh, the story. Yes, we will be. Yeah. No, but let's. But, but let's. I mean, first of all, Simply Whiskey. Um, I, I I know I've seen you do this before. What what are we going to do tonight? Well, if I think about the the idea of um, what you know Burns means to us all, and the idea that you know perhaps in many ways we can, or maybe we should, you know, rebrand Burns if not to ourselves, but to others to help many more people around the world understand more about Burns um, and the egalitarian nature of um, him and his work. We thought that. Um, we would try and um, bring one of these poems to life so that people could understand um, his work from a different perspective and, you know, go through the internet and, and inside the mind of this poet, Robert Burns. Now, this is just our particular take. As we've heard from the others, everyone has their own, you know, opinion of and uh, understanding of and you know, the emotions attached to his work and to the, to the great man himself. So this is just our perspective, um, whilst at the same time trying to make him more accessible and at the same time doing what we value more than anything else, which is having fun. Well, that's what you do at Simply Whiskey. And I've been to your events and we've done events together. And that is what you guys do. You take two, your two proud Scots, you take traditional Scottish themes, and it could be Burns, it could be Whiskey, it could be many other things that you've done events around the world. And 
make it accessible and fun and to be able to be seen in a totally new way. So hopefully that'll do that tonight. What's the story about? The most important thing, the most important thing is the people, right? How, how do people connect? Um, and, and yeah, that's what we're all about. We just want people to connect in any way they can, whether it's the poem, whether it's the visuals that we've got um, with us, with this story. For, for this story, for those people who don't know, Tama Shanter was, was a tale that was written by Robert Burns in 1790. So it was towards the end of his life. He was about 31 years old, um, about six years before he died. And it was written because a friend of his, Francis Grose, who was an antiquarian, um, needed a story or a poem to go with an illustration of Alloway Kirk. So Robert Burns, being the great friend that he was, helped him and he gave him this story, which is, uh, in my eyes, the greatest Scot poem or story in the Scots language ever. Um, it's about a man, and, it, and it's about something that we can all relate to. It's a story about a man who, after work, decides that he's going to the pub to see his pals to have a drink. The night goes on and on and on. His wife is waiting at home, and she's getting angrier and angrier. And he realizes at one point, I need to get up the road here, but he's steaming drunk. So it's the story of him going from the pub all the way to his house and the adventures that happen between those two places. And we've all done it, right? We wake up in the morning and we don't know, we don't know how we got home, but we managed it. So this is this is what Burns done. So this is Tamashanter, a tale. <laughs> when Chapman Billies leave the street and Druthy neighbors neighbors meet, as market days are weir and late, and folk begin to take the gate. Whilst we sit boozing at an appy, getting foo and unca happy. I think now on the Lang Scots miles, the mosses, waters, slaps, and styles that lie between us and our home, where sits. Sam, what's happened to you? <laughs> Shall we start again? Uh, maybe the kids are still up and they're doing some TikTok and shit. I don't know. I don't know what's. I don't know what's happening there. But you're right. We, we're going to start again because it's 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 just worth doing it right. Um, I apologize, viewers, of course, but also to you, Sam and Fred. That just means to get a wee bit of extra burns. There's no apology needed. That was fantastic. No, I introduction. I think it's a great summary. It's very important, I think, to understand what the story is about, as Rachel pointed out. And, um, and he put Galloway Kirk as one of the main focuses of the story, which is a beautiful thing for his friend, Francis Gross. Do you want to explain it again? Will you yell at the kids? I'll be back in about two minutes, or do you want to? It's, it's loading now. Let's see what happens. Yeah. I'm really sorry, everybody. Let's uh, let's get this right. It's so like we said, a simply a tale about getting home for the pub drunk and all the things that happen in between. Sam so got dial up. No Sam's streaming. Obviously, Sam's obviously still got dial up, and he's got to come into the world of the broadband. What time is it? This fucking homeschooling thing is twenty four seven, isn't it? <laughs> right, I'm out. Franchi, this is all you. Thomas Shanta, a tale. And Chapman Billy's leave the street, and Druthy neighbors neighbors meet as market days are weary and late, and folk begin to tack the gate whilst. We sit boozing at the nappy, getting foo and hunk of happy. We think now nah, on the Lang Scots miles, the mosses, waters, slaps and styles that lie between us and our home, where sits our sulky, sullen dame, gathering her bruise like gathering storm, nursing her wrath to keep it warm. This truth, Van Donis Tamashanter, is he, free air and acted canter, all dare where near a tune surpasses for honest men and bonny lasses, Oh, Tam, it's thou but being say wise as ten thine ain wife Kate's advice. She told thee well what thou was a skellum, a brethren, blustering, drunken blellum, that free November till October, ye make it day thou was not sober, that ilka melder with a miller, as sat long as thou would sell her, that every nag was called a shoon, the smith in thee got roaring foon, that at the Lord's house, even on Sunday, they drank the cups and gin till Monday. She prophesied that later soon thou will be found deep drowned in dune or catched with warlocks in the muck by Allah's old haunted cup. A gentle dame's it 
gars me great to think how many counsel sweet, how many length and sage devices the husband, fair wife, despises. But to her tale, ye merke me, I'm a planter, Uncle Ray. Fast firing on please and finally with reaming swats that drank divinely, and at his elbow, Suter Johnny, his ancient trusted Druthy crony. Tam lewed him like a berry, brother. They'd been through for weeks together. The nicht drove on with sangs and clatter, and I, the ale was growing better. The landlady, Tam grew gracious, but gave her secret, sweet and precious. The suitor told his queerest stories. The landlord's laugh was ready chorus. The storm with it. Micht rare and rustle, Tam didn't mind the storm a whistle. Care, mad to see a man so happy and drowned himself among the nappy. As bees flew home with lads of treasure, their minutes winged their way with pleasure. Kings may be blessed, but Tam was glorious. Or are the ills of life victorious? But pleasures are like poppies spread. You seize the flower, its bloom is shed. Or like the snow was on the river, a moment white then melts forever. Or like the Borealis race that flit, or you can point their place, or like the rainbow's lovely form of vanishing amid the storm. No man can tether time nor tide, the hour approaches, Tam, mun right. That hour and nicht, black arch the keystain, that dreary hour he mounts his beast in, and sick and nicht he tacks the road in, as near poor sinner was a brood in. The wind blawed as twas blown its last, the rattling showers rose on the blast, the speedy gleams, the darkness swallowed, loud, deep and lying, the thunder bellowed. That night, a child might understand. The deal and business on his hand. We'll mount it on his grey mare Meg, a better never lifted leg. Tam scalpel on through dub and mire, despising wind and rain and fire, whilst hodding fast his good blue bone it whilst grinding now her an old Scots sonnet, whilst glowering round with prudent cares, lest bogles catch him away. As come Galloway was drawing nigh, where ghosts and hoolies nicked the cry. By this time he was across the ford, where in the snow the chapman smore, and past the burks and meekle stain, where drunken Charlie Brack's neck bane, and through the winds and by the cairn, where Hunters fun that muck of burning. Near the thorn aboon the well where Mungo's mother hung herself. Before him, doon towards all her floods. The doubling storms rose through the woods. The lightnings flashed from pole to pole. Near and more near the thunders roll whilst glimmering through the groaning trees. Kirkalavi seemed in a blaze. Through Elka bore, the beams were glancing and it resounded. Mirth and dancing. Inspiring. Old John Barleycorn, what dangers thou canst make us scorn me? Tip an e, hearing evil way. Ishka be, will face the devil. Swats he reamed in Tammy's noddle. Fair play, he cared no deals a bodle, but Maggie, stood rit stare astonished, though by the healing hand admonished, she ventured forward on the left and, whoa, damn, so an uncle say. Warlocks and watches in a dance, Nick Cotillon, Brent Neufy, France. Hornpipes, jigs, craft bays and reels, put life and metal in their heels. Or when at bunker in the east, there sat old Nick in shape a beast, a towsy take, black grim and large, to gear him music was his charge. He screwed the pipes and got them skirrel, till roof and rafters added their own. Coffins stood round like open presses that showed the deed in their last presses and by some devilish cantry of slight, each in his ball on held a light, by which Heroic Tam was able to note upon the haley table a murderer's banes and gibbet turns, twa spang lang wee and christened bairns, a thief, you cut it for a rape with his last gasp, his gab did gain. Five tomahawks with blood red rusted, five scimitars with murder crusted, a garter which a babe had strangled, a knife for a feather's throat had mangled, whom his ain son a life bereft, the grey hairs yet snacked to the heft. Wait, they're a horrible and off, eh? But you meant the name with me and off, eh? The oil of tongues, and then say, Well, I seem like a beggar's man. Three priests, half strong, black as mud. Tammy Flowers remained curious, the mirth and fun grew fast and furious. The piper loud and louder blew, the dancers quick and quicker flew. They crossed, they set, they reeled, they click it to Lilka Carlin, swat and reek it, and goosed her duddies to the wark and liking at it in her sack. David Queens or Lumpies clapping in their fiends, their sacks, instead of creature flan and being snow white 1700 linen. These breaks of mine, my only pair that 
eens voor goed dat plush blue hair hebben, dat kind hem af mijn hart is voor een blinker day bonnie bonnie. But, with them, well dams. Hold and roll, right with the hags with spin a fall. Lighting and creaking on a crumb of a wonder, never turn my stomach. But Tam, Kent but was wet for brawly. There was ye wens and wench and wally. That night enlisted in the core, long after Kent and Carrick shore. For money a beast did she shot and perished money a bonny boat and shook, both meek old corn and bear and kept the countryside in fear. Her cutty sark, or paisley harn, as a lassie she had worn in longitude, though sorely scanty, it was her best and she was vanty. Thy little ken, thy reverend granny, that sark she caught for her wee nanny. Twa pun scotched was all her riches, would ever grace that dance of witches. But here, my muse, her wingman cure, sick flicks are far beyond her poor. To sing how nanny lap and flang a supple jade she was, and strang, how Tam stood like ain bewitched and thought his very e enriched. Even Satan glowered and fidged through fain and hotched and blew with mick and mane, till first ye keep her, sign another. Tam tinnies reason all together and yells out. Well done, Kitty Sack! And in an instant, Maggie, Maggie Rally, when out the hellish legion Sally does bees bazook with angry fight, when plundering herds are sailed their bike, as open pussy's mortal foes, when pop she starts afore her nose, as eager runs the market crowd, when catch the thief resounds aloud. So Maggie runs, the witch's folly. The money and Eldrick screech and holly, Ah, Tam, ah, Tam, I get thy fear in, and hail the rusty like a heron, in vain I can't waste thy coming, can't soon will be a wolf woman. Now, do thy speedy utmost, Meg, and win the keys to know the brig. There at them, know thy tail may toss, they're running stream the dirty cross. But if the keys to, she can make the faint a tail she had to shake for nanny, far before the rest, hard upon noble Maggie pressed, and flew at Tam with furious ettle, but little wish you, Maggie's metal, ye spring broke off. But Master Hale, I left behind a rain break tail. The Carlin clawed by the rump and left poor Maggie scarce a stump. Now, what a tale of truth shall read. Ilka man and mother's son take heed. When I are to drink, you are inclined. Our cutty sarks run on your mind. Think you might buy the joys of our dear. Remember, Tam O'Shanter's mare. Thank you. Well, well, Andy, how was that? How was that, Andy? Well, well. Absolutely superb. Absolutely superb. <laughs> ten you. out of ten. Ten. <laughs> Can you watch that again? Well, a, big, a, big, uh, a big heads up to Simon, who managed to put that video together in two days. Well done. <laughs> well done, Simon. That was superb. Yeah. For anybody uh, watching who's unaware, but um, you you recall that um, Andy pointed out um, the few of us grew up on air, and I very close to Burns Cottage, and, and all of the scenes that are in that uh, that film are in fact the the real locations from the the poem Tam O'Shanter. So the Kirk, for example, the bridge. Um, these are the actual places that Robert Burns would have visited. Uh, when house. Writing this poem. <laughs> And of course, you know, you saw the cottage in there where he was born. So hopefully um, that gives you the, uh, the interest in, in visiting these places for yourself to learn a little bit more um, about um, not only, you know, Tama Chan for that poem that you've just seen, um, and also Robert Mitz himself. Superb. Very great. That, that was really good. I'm sorry for the false part, everyone, but you absolutely nailed it there, Franchi. Thank you. And Simon, uh, you. I managed to keep in time with the visual, so that was a, that was a plus. It was like, it was so in case good. people aren't aware, um, Franchi, you were doing that live. You had no script. The middle of December, beginning of the middle of December, when I'm going to sleep at night, the first line will pop into my head because I know that Burns Night's coming up. <laughs> <laughs> and then I know I've got 15 minutes that I'm not getting to sleep because you, you can't stop it halfway through. You need to get to the end. <laughs> well, that's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. Yeah, it's, I, I remember doing burn suppers and, and you know people. It would be a real honour. Uh, it would be a real honour to be asked to do Tama Shanter, but, but also a great burden. And I remember one guy saying, "Oh, uh, good, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this has certainly shortened the window of, of winter for me to learn this thing. Uh, I hope that I do you proud." And his knees were trembling. So he rolled into the middle of the golf club or whatever it was, but it, it's it's a very difficult thing to do. Frankie absolutely nailed it, and Simon, those visuals are just brilliant. I mean, you guys should, should put that out. It's, it was superb. 
We don't own the copyright. Yeah, we don't own the copyright for the illustration. So if anybody knows what, uh, you know, please get in touch. <laughs> these are all, yeah, these are all, these are all famous Burns paintings. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but the videos for all us. Yeah. So yeah. I'm happy to enjoy. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was brilliant. Thank you. I think I think we should probably wind it out. Charlie has already put himself to bed. Charlie, we love you. Thank you for being a part of this yet again. Richard, congratulations again on your achievements. Over yeah, the last thanks very much. Thank you. Richard. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Rachel, thank you for joining us. Andy, great to see you as always. Simon, Franchi, again, beautiful Tam O'Shanter. Thanks for your patience and your contributions through the night. These fireside chess sessions are something that Dr. Nick has encouraged me to continue. And Nick, thank you. Well, thank thanks you. for inviting thank to the Simon. fireside, Simon, uh, Sam. It was uh, an absolute pleasure. Yeah, and such a good company. Amazing. I think, I, think people need, I think people need more of them. And I think they'll need more of them for a wee while. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, 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 Rachel, that's exactly, what I, that's exactly what I said to Sam earlier in the week, actually. So... Uh, one of the reasons genuinely I was I was so late was because we'd finished the class and people wouldn't leave. And I kind of realised that now what I need to do is do an online class and then there's an hour optional of just eating and drinking and just chatting to people that you don't know. That's what they need, isn't it? I think these things are I think these things are needed for people to continue. Because if you look, you know, even the, the people in the chat, the people, you know, they're people that you know, but this, you know, people need things like this right now. Absolutely. Uh, you know, Sam, we've, we've got a Burns night on Monday, uh, on the 25th, uh, and it's mainly with, with trade in the US and, and a bunch of invited guests. It's a bit late for anyone over there, but, uh, you know, we have asked bartenders to record a line each of, of Old Lang Syne. Uh, so at the end, we're actually going to play a compilation of Old Lang Syne from the point of view of, of bartenders. And we've, we've got a score for it, and so we're putting a video together. And it's amazing how many people have said, I, I want to do it, I want to do it. Um, because people uh, people love this. We always talk about how water separates the people of the world and whiskey brings them together. I think it's the same with this kind of thing. Uh, and, you know, talking about burns and, and togetherness and you know, old Lang Syne, old Lang Syne, we, we're, we're sentimental. We're talking about the old days and... Uh, we, we, there's no better way right now, um, and it's free. We can all get online for free. So uh, check out, check up on your friends, check up on the elderly. Um, we need each other more than more than ever right now. Yeah, well said. Richard, you, you you shared that sentiment earlier before Andy came on about the importance of this this pod. As tragic as it's been for so many, has us uh, reconcile some truths about ourselves, but also. A revalue reevaluation of what's actually important, and I, I know it is a cold medium to connect through, but I do feel like I've been here with you all tonight, and we're all watching. So thank you again very much. My friend Cat Spencer is going to sing us out with a oh, an appropriate song, I think, um, as she always does when we do these fireside sessions. So please hang out. I say good night and thanks again. Cheers, thanks man. again, Sam. Thanks, Sam. Really Sam. Good Sam. Good thank you. Thank you. Really enjoyed everyone's company. Changes that have come over me in these last few days. I've been afraid that I might drift away. So I've been telling old stories, singing songs that make me think about where I came from, and that's the reason why I seem so far away today. Oh, let me tell you that I love you. That I think about you all the time Caledonia, you're calling me And now I'm going home For if I should become a stranger You know that that would make me more than sad Caledonia's been everything I've ever had I have moved and I've kept on moving Prove the points that I needed proven I've lost the friends that I needed losing Found others on the way I have 
I've tried and I've kept on trying. Stolen dreams, yes, there's no denying. I've traveled hard with conscience flying. Somewhere with our wings. Let me tell you that I love you, that I think about you all the time. Caledonia, you're calling me and now I'm going home. For if I should become a stranger, you know that I would make me more than sad. Caledonia's been everything I've ever had. Now I'm sitting here before the fire, the empty room and the forest choir, the flames that couldn't get any higher. Well, they've withered now, they've gone. But I'm steady thinking the way is clear. And I know what I will do tomorrow when the hands have shaken and the kisses flow. Well, I will disappear. So let me tell you that I love you, that I think about you all the time. Caledonia, you're calling me and now I'm going home. For if I should become a stranger, you know that that would make me more than sad. Caledonia's been everything I've ever had. Caledonia's been everything I've ever had.